everybody can now hear us. Thank you, everybody, for getting to the Twitch chat. I already see Mr. Nitro and Mr. Matt G in the chat. Hopefully some more will come along because this is going to be a good show. All right, so a little behind the scenes. You guys are going to hear us do our startup. Uh, if everybody's ready to go, everybody can hit record now. I'm, I'm recording. Up. Okay, I'm not recording. I'm not recording. I didn't even pull up the recording software. I so. asked you if you were ready, Troy. I know, but I forgot. Jeez Louise, so man. Long. I do have audacity. Okay, cool. I was like, oh shit, I don't even know if I have a fucking recording app on here, but I do. I'm good. That would be bad. All right, let me make sure my software is uh, working. I am recording. Skip the update. Yeah, I, I don't like the new update. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and record. Uh, I'm, already I'm, already, I'm already recording. I'm already yeah, recording. The new update on uh, Audacity. Oh, wait, wait, let me make sure I've got the right fucking audio. Let me stop this. They, uh, they took away the cut button, so now you have to right click to cut. Let me check my audio settings to make sure I'm using the right. Very good. Man, what I really need is Dallas's defense to shut down Philly tonight, and I still have a chance to stay undefeated. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm rooting for Philly. Well, I'm only really pulling for Dallas because I got their defense. So. References. I'm fucking trying to figure out. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, it's using my red. Good. All right. Is everybody recording? I am recording. Yeah. I'm just confirming there, Mr. Yield. I'm just confirming that, yeah, I'm recording. Doing a clap, or we're just counting down together, right? Countdown. We're going to do five seconds of silence. Then I'm going to do the countdown. You match me three, two, one. We do the show, and at the end, we do the silence again, and then another countdown. Okay, but we don't clap. We do not clap. Just the counting down is the... Yeah, the clap is only for the video, and the video, I don't edit, so I don't need to sync that up. Cool. All right. Uh, five seconds of silence. Five, four, three, three two, two, one. one. You are listening to Trophy Horse with your host, Tricky Mick. Alex, I yield to no one. Steve. I'm Sid. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Trophy Wars. This is episode 545. I'm your host, Chicky Mick, alongside with me, the man, the myth, the legend. He's also a Crash Bandicoot. It's Alex. That's a nice lead-in, Tricky, because this week, I didn't play many games, but what I did conquer makes me feel incredibly accomplished as a video game player. He brings the awesome, even though he's a man-eater. It's Yield. I'll tell you what, that DLC is not anywhere as good as the main campaign. And making his long-awaited return. Many people have been asking. We have been looking forward to this for a long, long, long damn time. We're bringing back the business. It's Mr. Troy. How are you, sir? What's the business? God, All I right. missed that. Not too bad. <laughs> I, I would rather wait two to three years for another season of Game of Thrones. And, I, you know, I like House of the Dragon. But I would rather wait that long for another season than have to wait another six months to podcast with Troy again. Aww. Troy, you, you are uh, the second most requested guest that we have on this show. Cool. I, I feel honored. And uh, we I have to do a special shout-out because not a lot of people know this, but your wife is actually the voice in our intro and outro. Yeah. Like I said, at this point, my wife has been on more episodes of Trophy Horse than I have. <laughs> by a lot, I'm sure. That's, that's not a lie. Yeah, no, by a whole lot. She actually may have been on more episodes than any of us have because she's always here every week just by the intro, and sometimes the rest of us miss. Some of you get, miss a week or two. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. No, nah, probably not, though, because the, the intro song came pretty late. So, so 
Troy, I have to ask, since, you know, it's been a long time since you've been on the show, before we start the show proper, you know, you were a former host of the show, which I, I try all the time to try to get you back, but, you know, time-wise, it's just, can't, we can't do it. Um, what the hell's been up with your life in the last six months? Because I know you, you're a very busy man. Yeah, no, uh, so, I mean, the last time I was on, I know, I know I'd already started the business, because we talked about it, so. Yes. Uh, that still exists. Uh, there's not a lot going on. Uh, you know, life being what it is, okay. lots of stuff happens. Uh, one of the things that's happened is we had a child who is now, uh, she's is a girl, and she is healthy. But we had a hell of a first couple months with her. Um, she had a lot of uh, minor issues, but they had a major impact on her life. So it took us a couple months to get this one figured out. You know, like this will be my fourth child and, and probably final child, but this one would, wanted to make sure that, that uh, my life was not uh, boring. Uh, definitely threw a lot of curveballs that we weren't used to. Uh, but things are going well now. Uh, she's amazing, super happy, super cute. Um, and, but that's been between that and work, uh, my regular job. Uh, it's been most of my life. Uh, the business still exists, uh, and I'm still definitely, you know, toiling in, in the background as I have time. But uh, right now, family and regular life are dominating. All right. And for those that don't know, what do you do in real life? Because actually, I got to be honest, I kind of forgot. I am a project manager uh, in the construction industry right now, which is kind of weird. I fell into the construction industry. Um I mean, I could tell you the story. So I, I went to New Mexico State University, got a bachelor's in marketing. I have an MBA, master's of business administration. I wanted to move to Seattle to get a job in the gaming industry. Uh, and the job that got me here was a job working in facilities at Microsoft. So I came and did a, I think it was a nine month uh, stint at, at Microsoft. Um, and as soon as that was done, uh, the next job that I was able to land was another construction uh, at the time of the project coordinator job uh, working at, at, at the time was Oculus VR uh, in their facilities. Um, and I have been there for four years now, but I've moved up now. I'm an assistant project manager. Uh, but once again, all in facilities and construction. So uh, even though my client that I am embedded with, I, I work at, at Meta uh, now after, I mean, there's been like three reorganizations since I've been there in the last four years. but. Uh, what I do is is I work on building out the facilities for for Meta as they uh, if they lease a new space, my team goes in and, and kind of redesigns and rebuilds everything to make it what Meta needs it to be. Uh, we're actually currently also building a ground up construction uh, in Redmond, Washington. My my project that I'm currently working on uh, solely myself is I'm installing a traffic light, which is super exciting for me. Um, you better not you better not be putting a camera on it. Uh, no, no, it doesn't have a camera. But so it, the thing is, it's like this traffic light is right in the neighborhood of where I work. So one of these days, I am inevitably be going to be late for work because of my traffic light. And I will be like, what idiot put this traffic put, light put here? Put this traffic light here. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so from now on, anytime anybody comes to visit, I'm going to take them to show them my traffic light because that's literally going to be the first project that I delivered on my own. Um, I've been a part of billions of dollars worth of projects over the last four years, but I'm actually managing the installation of this traffic light. So, so if if by some miracle I wind up getting a job with Meta in the future, are you the man to come to and make sure I get a corner office? Uh, no, I just build it out. The teams, the facilities, and the, the end users actually get to decide how everything is used up. We just... uh, so I can't use you as a hook to say, "Listen, I know, I know the designer. He he designed this office for me." Yeah, no, definitely not. Uh, but hopefully, you're in the uh, planning stages of making the the facility, and, and you stake your claim. <coughs> you, do you yeah, notice so that, I Troy? I'm, I'm a project manager uh, for Meta, uh, actually VR adjacent. Like, I'm working at Meta Reality Labs, uh, but I'm not actually working on any of the cool products. I'm building the facilities that all the people who are making all the cool products work in. Hey, Troy, do you notice that? Like, the, instead of, you know, Tricky just saying, if I ever, you know, come out to visit you or spend some time with you, is like, hey, could you give me a job, essentially? Hey, could you give me a nice office? He's just trying to use you for stuff. Yeah. Uh, but, but, hey, that stoplight... You know, I know people get really annoyed with stoplights because there are times, you know, when we're all late to work and it's like, grr, you know, it seems like the whole world's against you when you get that red light. But you're installing something that's going to save lives. It's going to keep sure. people safe. Well, so, uh, I mean, the building that it's going outside of, I've actually, I actually sat in that building for a while. And it, 
when you're leaving this this road is like one of the main uh, thoroughfares between Redmond and Kirkland, Washington, and it's kind of like just this this one road. It gets a lot of traffic, and I've had to cross the street to get to a northbound bus before, and you're basically playing Frogger because there's no easy way to get across that street until I put this traffic light in. So I'm actually, it, it's actually a, a much needed traffic light for sure. Uh, hear that, y'all? We all know who grew up on Frogger now. We know who was really, really good at Frogger because he's winning in real life. He's still in traffic, yeah. And um, so that's the reason why I started the business, though, is like, well, I wanted to get in the video game industry. I've actually, like, done really well in this construction job, which is not anything that I ever thought I would be in. Uh, it's still not a, a passion. If I wasn't, if I didn't have the client that I have being meta, I don't know that I would, like, I couldn't build schools. I wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, but being able to work on, on Meta Reality Labs projects has made it so that it's, it's tolerable and also, I mean, the, the, the client's really good to me to, in so much that they keep dictating to my parent company that I keep getting raises and promotions, which is making it really hard for me to break into the video game industry because uh, I, I can no longer sustain myself on a $15 an hour tester job, which is what I've been told I should do to get industry experience. So even though I have project management experience and continue to have project management experience, it's real tough for me to, to get into a producer role, which is what I really want, uh, because people want industry experience. And so I was sitting around, I was like, well, crap, you know, like I can't afford to do the entry level role. It'll get me there. And nobody's really looking at me for the roles that I that I really want. So I started thinking, I was like, well, I I know how to do a business. Like I, I, I know business, so why don't I just, uh, spin up a business, teach myself how to make games. Obviously, they're not going to be super high, you know, quality games to start with, but, you know, it's a start and basically just put up uh, Acid Rain Studios and Acid Rain Games, which is the same company just uh, doing business as uh, Acid Rain Games. And so that's where I'm at now. I started an LLC, so now everything that I'm spending to try and learn how to make games is basically a tax write-off for me. This space that I'm sitting in, because I can't use it for a tax write-off for my regular job, but it's my office, Acid Rain Games, and so guess what? I get to write it off on my taxes. For the All right. Well, speaking of your office, we have a question from the chat. Uh, <laughs> Matt G wants to know, Troy, can I see the Timberwolf? What other battle mechs are, are on your shelf, and where did you get them? Timberwolves, actually. Um, there's a white one and a... Dragoon's Battle Damage Timberwolf. It has... Uh, auto rotary, rotary auto cannons in the arms. Oh, stand by one second. Hold on. Let me get rid of your trophy card. Uh, do, do, do. This Wait. is this one. And there then you can see the white one there, which is basically a regular. Okay, now they can see it. Yeah, this one's supposed to be the battle damage wolf dragoon's version. It's got rotary auto cannons on the arm. Um, other one. Uh, front mission. So it's one of the Wanzers from the front mission. Uh, and then in the background, I have the uh, Destroid, Tomahawk, and Bender. Uh, they're from Robotech, but also Battletech. So uh, the Battletech would be called a Warhammer, but it's the Destroid Defender, I think. Oh, the other one's not the Tomahawk. I can't remember what it is in, in uh, uh, Rifleman Battletech. That's what those are. <laughs> all right. This this is all for the video. Uh, so go to YouTube yeah, if you guys are not right. see this live. Uh, oh, yeah, I do. I, I, I'm kind of a mech guy. So I have the <coughs> Atlas up here from Titanfall. I've got Mecha over here with Diva. There's some more Diva over here. Uh, I'm kind of a mech guy. I like mechs. All right. Thanks let's... for the question. <laughs> Let's get into the show proper. Let's do our update trophy count. I am level 684, total trophies of 16,846 with 373 platinums. Alex? Troy, I'm telling you, you, you know, you just sitting there, you know, spinning all those, those nouns and verbs and everything, those adjectives, like you just, it had me in a trance here because I just now pulled up my trophy list. <laughs> level 464, total trophy count of 8,140, the platinum count of 131 in 130 games. Yield. Let me click the right tab. <laughs> Level 481 with a trophy count of 8838. It'd be really awesome if I could have all eights one week, but I'm sure I'll overshoot that. 
And a trophy count of 159. I got another new platinum. All right, we'll get into that in a minute. Sid is level 755. Total trophies of 18,540 with 556 platinums. And Troy, where are you saying these days? I am currently at level 335, which sounds relatively close to a couple of you, but then my total trophy count is 3,615 with 42 measly platinums. Yeah, you you never fell down the rabbit hole like I did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're, you're an honorable trophy whore. Also, yeah, I my trophy list. I think I'm I'm pretty proud of it. The ones that I have, I'm, I'm pretty pretty proud of. So. All right. So I have to clarify something. Uh, I said I was going to do this on last week's show, but obviously I took the time off last week, and I want to thank everybody for sending the messages and whatnot. Uh, it was a rough week, and I appreciate Alex and Yield uh, taking over the show. Uh, and I appreciate the kind words that Alex said. Uh, I was in the background running the Twitch stream, so I, I heard the show live, but you know I didn't outright say this to anybody. So I just want to make sure publicly I say thank you for all your love and support. It was appreciated. Um, but I need to talk about the PlayStation Stars program because I posted a meme, which I found out to be a kind of misleading. Um, and I know which meme was that? It was the meme, um, and I'm going to try to find it as I'm speaking, so I might, like, uh, go a you've little posted, bit. You've posted a lot lately. Yes, <laughs> I've been uh, very active. Um, <clears throat> while I find that, uh, we did have some breaking news, and uh, if you guys can just vamp for a minute, I appreciate it. Uh, about an hour before the show went live, uh, Konami updated their Facebook page to a Silent Hill logo, and it seems like we're going to be getting a Silent Hill game. Uh, so if you guys could vamp on that second, why find the 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 pitch the picture that I fa- that I posted was mis- a little misleading. Uh, the only thing we know about Silent Hill right now, as my computer is taking forever to come up, is that it's going to be unveiled on Wednesday, October nineteenth. So at two p.m. Uh, Pacific time. So that's five o'clock Eastern. And I don't know about the other things. So the day the show comes out on the podcast services, later that day, sometime, we're going to be getting an official announcement of Silent Hill. So if you guys can vamp for a second while I find the the picture, and then I'll come back to that. I mean, we, we touched on this last week where it was heavily hinted at and even commented by the res- the uh, Silent Hill movie producer back from 2006, that uh, or the movie director. I don't remember exactly what his uh, his role was. But he was very heavily involved with the movie and the direction of the movie, and he had said that they were working on new Silent Hill games, including Bluebird Team working on a Silent Hill 2 remake. So I mean, my only question, if you're going to call it Silent Hill, is this a reboot? Is it a remake? I mean, we know that they had, um, based on that interview, that Konami has looked at the success of the Resident Evil remakes, and you know maybe they see a remake as the best way to step back into this before they release a new game. But we got Yield's thoughts and my thoughts on it as we were talking to JT, but Troy, what are your thoughts on Silent Hill? Because I, you know, I, we haven't had you on recently to talk about anything like this. I remember playing the first Silent Hill. I don't even think I was actively played it by myself. I think I was playing it in conjunction with uh, my cousin at the time on the original PlayStation. Uh, it was cool. Um, and, but yeah, I think, I think probably kind of going back to the drawing board and doing a remake sounds like a very feasible a good idea. I know. I don't know how how many total Silent Hill games were made, but I think probably like what five or six of them. Um, it, I think it makes a lot of sense to start over uh, and kind of reboot the franchise. Seems very reasonable. And I mean, I think by all accounts, the the series kind of like I think Silent Hill Two is viewed as the most prestigious of the games and everyone's favorite when they talk about Silent Hill. And, you know, there may have been some game, good games released beyond that, but I think that Silent Hill 2 was kind of the peak of everything. So if you're going to release, you know, like I said, Bluebird Team would be a good team to get on that. And if you're going to release any game in the series, well, as a remake, that would certainly be a good one to do it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I just felt, and I don't know how you, if you feel this the same way, Troy, that we had all kind of made jokes at Konami's expense and about their business strategy in recent years and how they had treated their their franchises do you see this and all you know konami's had success with the collections they've released in recent years do you see this as a konami kind of stepping back up to the plate and reinvigorating where they had once seemed kind of lost on the path one would hope so i mean you kind of hold judgment i mean you look at what 
Metal Gear Survive turned into after Kojima left, right? Like, they kind of used all the assets and made kind of a mediocre survival game out of it. Uh, I definitely hold judgment. Um, but uh, one, one thing I want to see out of Konami, though, I, I want to see them release the Metal Gear Asset games on a p platform that I can play. <laughs> that's That's got to be an easy easy get right just freaking port it to you know, i don't know anything literally <coughs> all right uh yield before we cut it off and go back to what do you have any comments on this no because i've never played silent hill so all right all right so i found the picture that i posted i posted it back on october 5th um and it, it's a picture of a tweet and the tweet is from deek tweak uh yeah uh, he says, PlayStation Rewards is definitely off to a bad start. 50 points for redeeming a $70 game. Redeeming a free game costs up to 17,500 points. The ratio is absurd. Um, so I posted that, and then uh, I, I left a comment saying, you have to buy $350, $70 games to get a free one. Oh, and your points expire 24 months after you earn them. Oh, uh, okay, I remember this conversation because we figured it would be like twenty five thousand dollars for a game. Yeah, your one of your comments is uh, the two I figured out the three hundred fifty uh, games at seventy dollars pop. You would have to spend twenty four thousand five hundred dollars just to get a free game. Okay, so this is not entirely accurate, and I'm not here to defend the ratio, but I want to clarify the ratio. Um, the tweet and I fell for it um, was based on a PlayStation Stars reward. That if you bought a certain game, they would give you 50 uh, bonus points. Bonus additional. Right. So it's not 50 points for every $70 you sold uh, or you spend. Um, and I put uh, and I updated the post to say um, that I bought 18 games that day. And not one game cost me more than $2. And I had 483 points. So... Um, all in all, I got 483 points and I spent $53 at most. And I, I, and I think that I, I think I went into my receipts to find that out. So I don't know the math. And if somebody wants to do the math, I mean, we got the businessman on here right now. Um, I, I don't know what that breaks down to being how many points per dollar and how much you would have to actually spend to get 1,750 points. Or seventeen thousand five hundred points included sales tax. You're probably close to a dollar a point, right? Like, if you take the sales tax out of the equation, that I mean, that sounds pretty accurate. I mean, in the ballpark, right? I mean, give or take, but like that seems like a decent guesstimation. Um, I think it would have to be ten points per dollar. Oh, uh, I don't know, but no, because well, okay, yeah, it would be. You're right, because if you spent fifty and you got close to or. Say 45, close to 400, something. Yeah, right. All right. So, I mean, I'm not, like I said, I'm not here to defend the ratio. I'm not saying, like, this is a good or bad thing. I just wanted to clarify that because the the 50 points, uh, according to the tweet, was just a bonus if you bought one of the five games. Um, And I also, like, uh, I, I was a little upset that some of the games that bought were games that were released before PlayStation Stars was released. So... I kind of got screwed because uh, I think the five games were NBA 2K23, Saints Row 5, the TMT Collection, The Last of Us Part 1, and Madden. And I already own two of those. So, and I have no interest in buying NBA. I have no interest in buying Madden. And with the mixed reviews of Saints Row, I, I don't think I'm going to buy that. But I just wanted those to clarify. To get you the extra 50 points is what... Right. Okay. So, I, I just want to clarify, it's not... 50 points for every $70 you spent. You're basically getting 10 points for every dollar as, you know, me and Troy just worked out. So, just to clarify, that's the way it is. It's not as bad as the that picture made it out to be. Well, that's uh, good. Uh, so, I mean, I could do the quick math to see how much 1,700 points. Uh, well, you could divide that. You would have to spend $1,750 to get a free game. That's still ridiculous. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm not defending that, like, like again, but, but it's a lot better than twenty four thousand five hundred dollars. So is it is it all or nothing? Like, or does it work like the like the Nintendo Gold points, where it's like, oh, you can put however many points you have to discount 
what you're purchasing. It's all like, you it, have to get this much to get a free game. As far as I can tell so far, it's all or nothing. Okay. Yeah, now, that's, that's a lot. I mean, the, the worst part is that the points go away, right? Because yeah. after what, a year? Yeah, they tw- go away? 24 sure. months. 24 Which months or two I, years. I, I think that's a big bunch of bull crap right there because unless they're going to put stuff in that you can buy, you can use it to get like money in your PSN wallet, you know, or you can you purchase. Can. There, there you are can. different rewards. Okay, there are. So you can get like maybe you can get a DLC pack or something like that. Because otherwise, I'm okay. Somebody like me, I buy you know ninety percent of my stuff physical. So there's no way I'm hitting seventeen hundred dollars online in two years. Right. Well, uh, and I mean, like you know, if it takes a while to get to a free game, that's fine. I can accept that. But when you make the points go away, you put this time sensitive stamp on it where you kind of pressure people with like, well, if you don't use these points, you're going to lose them. Thereby, you know, trying to facilitate that urge to spend money. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to have these points. I'm going to get a free game anyway. I'll just buy this, you know, this many games or get to the plateau where I have enough money. So it's kind of, you know, almost in a way like, yes, you're getting a free game out of it at a certain point. But it's one of those things like where it's like, hey, things are on sale, blah, blah, blah. So you end up spending more than you would have intended to because you're trying to get to a certain point or you're trying to get what you perceive as your money's most out of it. All right. And I, I just brought up the PlayStation app. So uh, just to give you an idea of points, uh, Yield, you were just talking about getting PSN dollars for $1,250. Or excuse me, 1250 points, you can get $5 in the store. So basically, that equates to every $125 you spend, you get $5 back. Ouch. That's, yeah. That's rough. That's rough. <laughs> I mean, I, for every hundred, wait, wait. I know I'm on a PlayStation podcast, and I don't want to, you know, put Nintendo up as the gold standard for anything, but the way they do their gold point system seems to be way better in that when you buy physical games like you claim them on your your account and they give you gold for that too so even if you're like yield and me when you're owning mostly physical games you still get gold points for that they do expire so that's similar but i think the fact that you can incrementally cash them in it's like oh i want to use this towards this purchase to lower the cost i think helps mitigate that like versus like having to get at least 1200 points in order to get a five dollar voucher like that's that's real rough well, uh, and they they, all, they also still give you credit for buying physical games. Yeah. So you're like, oh, yeah, I own that game. And they, they should be able to verify it that, you know, hey, you've played this game. So, yeah, you own it. Yeah, well, the, the problem is with that is you can easily go to GameStop, rent, uh, rent a used game, bring it home and say, oh, I bought this and get the points for it. Nintendo has a way around that, too. I don't know what their system is, but I, I'm willing to bet you couldn't buy a used game that somebody's already claimed the points for and then claim them again on your account. I could be wrong, but... Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't that. Nintendo, like, when you, when you buy a physical Nintendo game, doesn't it have a code? I mean, it's probably got code hard-coded into the card itself. That well, you have to... Well, at least I know... I, I can't remember what system it's for, but I guess it was the Wii. You had to, like... It was like, hey, register your game on my Nintendo Club with this code. Sure. I don't know if that's what's happening, but it's it's all in the Switch actual like UI. Like You just go in and you say, hey, I want to claim this game, and it gives you the gold points. I don't know if that's what's happening. It's, like, it's probably what's happening is you're registering that game to your account in some way, which probably prevents somebody else from going, and like you're basically passing games around with your friend group and just like compiling a buttload of gold points, but... I still think it's a better solution than what Sony's got here, at least on the face of it. All right. Uh, just to go through the rest of this, uh, for 5,000 points, um, you get a $20 voucher for the PSN. Uh, now, what started this controversy with the, the games, um, just for clarification, I don't know how much these games are retailing for, so I don't know like, if this is a good thing or not thing. Cult of the Lamb is 6,250 points. It takes two is ten thousand points. Shakira, Sekiro is fifteen thousand points. The game that co- caused the controversy is the Quarry, which is seventeen thousand five hundred points. And then you got Hades for uh, sixty two hundred and fifty points. Those are the current rewards that you can redeem. So it's like kind of a promotion in a way. Instead of putting your game on sale, it's like, hey, you get more credit for these games, so go buy them now. Right. It seems like a discount, right? It's like fifty thousand. Oh, oh, points wait. to get twenty dollars. Hold on a second, Alex. I want to clarify. That's redeeming points 
to get the game, not buy the game. That's how many points you get. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so how much was it to get the twenty dollar gift card or whatever? Five five thousand points. Five thousand points get you twenty bucks. So I mean, some of those games, like it takes two, I think is close to you know twenty thirty dollars. I don't know what the current rate is, but it seems like you're probably getting a little bit of a discount by using your points to purchase it versus potentially paying at least the the PSN price. Well, um, it takes two. I don't know if it's the same as the because I still have a PlayStation uh, credit card that gives you you know points that you can use to like buy. I use it to buy PSN cards. Um, but I feel like games that are on there, like they're only slightly discounted from what like full retail is. Like they're not even current PSN prices on a lot of those games. Well, I mean, just judging by if it's five thousand points to get twenty dollars in a, in a PlayStation uh, thing, and it takes two is uh, ten thousand points. They're equating that you know the game is forty dollars. So, yeah. and and just like uh, Troy was just saying, I have the PlayStation card. So anytime I make a uh, a PlayStation Store purchase, I use the card and I get points on that side. Um, Are these points the same? Like, do they? No, they're not the they're not the same points. But I could use the points on my PlayStation card to redeem, uh, you know, certain things. It's like TV stuff like that. I mean, don't, the the TVs are astronomical. Like, I'm never gonna redeem sure. points for that. It's like it's like when you go to play like uh, games at Dave and Buster's, right? And they've got like the 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 karaoke machine, and it's like nine million tickets to get it, right? How much are you gonna spend to get that karaoke machine? Right. Uh but you know, just to clarify, I, I want to make sure that you know I I was straight with that. I'll, again, I'm not defending it. I'm just clarifying the the point in the the conversation. All right, so let's get back into the show proper. Uh, I think we did the trophies. So, Troy, what have you been playing, sir? Oh, he's eating. All right, we'll go to Alex. I got a mouthful of stuff. Go, go, go to somebody else. Real quick. Alex, we'll go to you, sir. Submitted for the approval of the Midnight Society, I call this story the Stormy Ascent. So, uh, most of my um, by the by the way, if you uh, if you like if you grew up on are you afraid of the dark you would probably like the midnight club on netflix really good show so far um by the people who did by mike flanagan who did haunted, uh house on a haunted hill uh bly manor as well as um midnight mass enough promo in a way uh so basically my entire week was centered around finishing one game and it's in, in particular getting one gold trophy do you all remember when they released the crash insane trilogy how afterwards they released a level in the original Crash Bandicoot that was supposedly so hard that they cut it out of the original game? I do not remember that. Well, the level... So anyway, uh, to get the Platinum Trophy in the original Crash Bandicoot as part of the that uh, collection, you don't have to play this level. But at post-release, they actually released a new level for Crash 3, Crash Warp, called Future Tense, and they released, finally, a level called Stormy Ascent, that was a what was described as just an, an incredibly hard level, and it is. Um, so when they, of course, when these levels came out, they attached trophies to them, and a gold trophy for I think. Um, let me see what is the I'm trying to think of what the name of the, uh, the actual trophy is, but basically to get one of the trophies on the uh, Stormy Ascent level, you have to get a gold relic on the uh, the level. Essentially, you have to beat the level in under 400 minutes and 30 seconds, and you got to do it all in one run. You can't die. There are no checkpoints. So much of my week was, was focused on that. Uh, it had been years since I played those games. Now, at first, I was like, you know what? Screw this. I'm not playing this level for this trophy. I don't care about the relic, whatever. You know, Now that I'm in the great trophy reclamation of 2022 and I'm going back and playing old games, I set my sights on this, and you know, after three days, I finally, finally beat Stormy Ascent, got the gold trophy, and... It's listed on uh, PSN profiles as a 0.2% claim trophy. So it's a very, very rare one. Ultra rare, I would say. Uh, and I'm quite proud of myself that I was able to beat Stormy Ascent and uh, get the relic. Uh, not it's, Honestly, it's one of those levels you play over and over again for hours. You get the muscle memory correct. So where you know exactly when to jump, you get the timing right. You know, when platforms are appearing and disappearing, appearing and disappearing. Know when to jump on certain enemies or when to tur attack certain en enemies and you'll be safe. So basically, it's just one a giant exercise in muscle memory. So, uh, but yeah, very proud of that one. Other than that, been playing some Street <clears throat> Rage Four, trying to get uh, another trophy in that, mop up a, a silver trophy for the 
Mr. X's Nightmare DLC. And uh, this week, I actually probably will be picking Rocket League back up because the Haunted Hallows starts on Wednesday. And this year, in previous years, they've done Ghostbusters. They've done Batman last year. But this year, it's going to be the uh, the famous, the horror, the icons of horror. So they got stuff centered around Leatherface, Chucky, uh, Sam from Trick or Treat. And I can't, there are two more, and I can't exactly remember what they are right now. But, uh, oh, Saw. So the uh, the Saw uh, franchise is also in there. So, yeah, it's, it looks like it's going to be a fun Haunted Hallows. So I'm going to be picking up my sticks and uh, playing some Rocket League on this this Wednesday. All right, yield. Well, let's see here. I did play a little Rocket League. I've been playing some of the Truth Quest Maneater DLC. I've been playing some Deep Rock Galactic. Uh, Immortals Phoenix Rising. And my platinum was Rayman Legends. Yes, you did say you were probably going to have that by the time the show came out. I did. I got it Monday. All right. And Troy, are you done eating? Yeah, I, I, I didn't take another bite. <laughs> <laughs> um, so well, I think the last time I was on here, I was playing a game on my 3DS, uh, uh, Ghost Recon Shadow Wars, turn-based tactics game on the 3DS. Uh, I have finished that game. So here's the thing about me is I don't have a whole lot of time to play video games much anymore. I'm lucky if I get like two or three hours in, mostly on handhelds because my kids and family take up all the television time. So and it's usually after everybody goes to bed when I'm laying in bed. So the handhelds are keying for me right now. So I finished up the 3DS game. Uh, pretty great. Uh, and in my mission to uh, play all of the turn-based tactic games that I can. I'm actually currently playing a PlayStation game on a PlayStation console, um, and uh, there will be no trophies, uh, but oh, I'm currently playing through the PlayStation 1 version of Final Fantasy Tactics on my trusty Vita uh, with the L2, R2 grip on there, so I have L2 and R2, um, but that's currently what I'm playing it, as I have time. Uh, both my son and my wife have been playing way more video games than me. They're currently working through Let's Go Eevee on the Switch, uh, which I think is if if the Pokemon franchise is like the 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 best starter JRPG, I think the Let's Go version of those are the best starter starter RPGs. Because like my son is four years old, he can totally grasp it. He's using little. Uh, uh, pokeball controller and he's basically running the game on his own and it's it's kind of great and the only the only mechanic that's different between it and the baseline like the pokemon yellow from from the game boy is that instead of random battles when you're walking through the tall grass like pokemon spawn and you basically do the pokemon go thing where you're throwing pokeballs to try and catch them uh, but other than that like almost it's almost a, a one for one remake of, of pokemon yellow which is kind of spectacular um it's been great watching them play it but Unfortunately, I haven't had a lot of time to play it myself. Um, Let's Go is a lot of fun, and, and when they introduced that thing about how Pokemon spawn in the overworld and you see them walking around, that was a big thing that, you know, they do in Sword and Shield, they do it in Legend of Arceus. That was kind of like a turning point for the mainline franchise because that, like before, you just walked in the tall grass and, you, you know, they, they would battle. Yeah. Random battle. But seeing them in the wild is definitely, it definitely makes for a much better atmosphere for your game and kind of creating the idea that yes these pokemon are part of the same world that your character is and i i think it was a big step for the <coughs> franchise it, you know a small step maybe in a lot of people's minds but it was a huge thing they, they got a lot of people excited and i'm glad to see they've continued uh as the series goes on so and you know yeah. before you get to dead space and resident evil you got to go through pokemon so <laughs> you know four years old maybe a little bit too young just yet yeah i mean it's working great like uh, like i said he's getting the concept of moving in a 3d space they're learning, uh, both my wife and him are learning things like, hey, sometimes you gotta grind up some XP to you go get your get your Pokemon, and you wanna keep all your Pokemon level because all of the opposing Pokemon are leveled to your 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 primary one, which is either Eevee or Pikachu, depending on which version you have. So right now their they're, they're Eevee is at like level 48, but the rest of their Pokemon are like level 37 to like 42, and they're kind of getting stomped in these fights. And I'm like, look, all of these opponents you're fighting are leveled to your Eevee. So if you're not spending any time leveling up the rest of your Pokemon, like they're gonna drag behind. So you want to make sure your party is is pretty even. Uh, so they're kind of learning all of these JRPG tropes, which is kind of cool. 
does that game I, I can't remember does that game not have like experience share where everyone in your party gains a little bit of experience so they do yeah battle? as long as they haven't faded uh they they get some a little bit of experience even when you catch a pokemon they get like 20 30 experience points across the board um and if they actually actively took part in a battle, they get a they get a larger chunk. So if you like rotate through your Pokemon while you're battling, they'll actually all get a little bit of bigger bump. All right. Anyway, welcome to the Nintendo podcast, everybody. <laughs> uh, coming from the chat, uh, Matt G says he just started watching Are You Afraid of the Dark on Paramount Plus. Yeah, they got new episodes out. So if you grew up on the series, Paramount Plus does have new episodes. I did approve of your reference, by the way. I, I really I, I appreciated that. Thank you, sir. I, fig- I figure everyone in our generation would get it because that was like such a staple of most kids growing up. I mean, if you had a television um, and you watched Nickelodeon, it's pretty much like, what am I going to do on Saturday night? Watch watch Snick. And it works with the, the month of October. So, yeah, all around. Great reference. All right. Uh, I'm just trying to update things over here. Cause what I did felt... you play, Tricky? Did you tell, tell us? I did not. I always go last. Um, I've been playing a very little bit of the Division 2. Uh, I have been playing mostly Detroit Become Human, uh, going back and getting that platinum. Uh, I'm currently working on the, my second playthrough to get that platinum. Uh, what else have I been playing? Uh, Lawnmower uh, Simulator. Uh, do not play that game, even though it's free. It's horrible. I thought you couldn't play Spam. That's not Spam. That's the a game centered around a lawn mowing simulator is not spam. It's a 10-hour platinum. Oh, that's awful. Why would they do that to people? <laughs> <laughs> it's like Goat Simulator and Surgeon Simulator, like that whole, like... Actually, I take that back. I apologize. It is not a 10-hour platinum. It's a 60-hour platinum. I was going to say, I don't think it's a 10-hour platinum. It's that's a... Not. Hey, kids, we know that you really like to play ga- games for escapism. How would you like to do video chores, the video game? How about you go take out the trash or rake some leaves or wash some dishes? Like, sounds terrible. I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. It, it's it's not good. Uh, I go back and add a game. Like, I just now realize that I am playing a game actively, as actively as I play games, to try and, and the ultimate goal is to get the platinum in it, and that is Transformers Devastation on the PS4. I am actively set myself on. I'm going to get the platinum in this game. Who knows how long that's going to take me, but that is a game that I'm working on. All right. Uh, Donnie would be proud with the, uh, what do we play in DLC? We always had that. We always tried to get a soundbite for that, but never came to fruition. All right. Let's get back to the show. Um, as I stall. Uh, first topic we have coming from IGN. Uh, I don't know why this was news, but fa- apparently Deathloop has officially been confirmed uh, to be part of the Dishonored universe. Uh, this is coming from Adam Bankhurst. Uh, this confirmation comes, by the way, of Deathloop director and Arcane Lion Studio director Dinga Bakababa, uh, who appeared on the official Xbox podcast um, and stated that it is officially part of the Dishonored universe. Uh, I've never played any of the Dishonored games, but apparently there are five of them. I did. I thought there were only two. So, uh, Troy, you give me a side eye. Like, <laughs> I definitely knew there were two Dishonored games. I, I mean, I guess there might be spinoffs, but like the two big ones are Dishonored and Dishonored Two, right? And then they have like DLC yes. for them, like Death of the Outsider or whatever. But I just assume those were expansions on. The various games. Maybe uh, they're counting those. Yeah, the the knife of Dunwall, the bridges, uh, the witches of Brigmore. Is that the other one? And they were DLC for the first game, but I, I oh, is that is that what games. is that what it is? I would think. I mean, they, they. I don't know. They could have come up with completely different spinoff games on top of that. For okay. Sure. The, okay. Then you know, take take what I just said. I just I just looked down and said Dishonored Universe all stories in order, and there was five of them. There was Dishonored. Well, I mean, if they if they're considering Deathloop part of that universe, is that? I get, kind of like how Eco Shadow of the Colossus and Last Guardian are all the same universe. Do they then consider that part of the Dishonored stories? Uh, I, Deathloop. I, I, I apparently apparently it's uh, a spinoff. Yeah, so they said in the article that they basically consider it what happened at the end of Death of the Outsider, right? Like that's kind of their envisioning of the continuation of that story. All right. I I was not a Dishonored fan. Uh, I don't know if anybody else played Dishonored, but if I I know there was some interest in played it. I haven't played it. I know there was some interest with uh, Alex with you with Deathloop. 
Well, I well, yeah, I mean, I heard good and bad things about Deathloop, and I did play Dishonored. I, I never played the sequel, but I had the Platinum Trophy for the first Dishonored. And, you know, it was a really fun game. I enjoyed it quite a bit, but, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it makes sense. that they, Like, there was so much of Deathloop that looked a lot like Dishonored, and it was made by the same studio, so it all kind of fits together. Um, but, yeah, Dishonored was a really good game. Obviously, I didn't play the second one, so I didn't feel the need to continue the story. I wasn't so wrapped up in the story that I needed to go on, but, you know, people continuing their universe outside of... You know, you don't have to make a sequel to kind of continue the narrative and continue the story of a universe, and, you know, it's good to see the game developers see that, and it's like, hey, we're going to make a different game with different mechanics that feel similar, but also we're going to continue the story, even if it's not tagged as Dishonored 3. Isn't, like, Control is similar with Alan Wake, right? It's supposed to be in the same universe. Um, uh, well, spoiler if anyone has, hasn't played it, but... <laughs> uh, we don't have to go into this discussion, but it's a similar well, concept, right? Alan Wake is in one of the, the Control DLCs. Yeah. He's confirmed in there. So, like, they're intertwined, yes. Uh, yeah. Good for them. I mean, I, I don't think I would be as, as invested in finding Easter eggs as some of these other people, and now that it's been confirmed, I don't even have to you know speculate about it cool if i play them all right i know this is a part of the dishonored universe well i mean i just, just a question just popped in my head and I'll, I'll go to yield first uh do you think this is a they do you think they use death loop to try to get people invested into the D dishonored universe uh my initial reaction is no, because immediately everybody figured that it was death loopish, or not death loopish, was it was dishonored ish, and they've all they always kind of speculated that it was attached to it somehow. So this is just confirmation, in my opinion. I mean, if if you if it's kind of hard once you've released two games in a series to then try to use another game to get people excited for that game you released two like retroactively, games for. yeah, yeah, if people. If people weren't enough excited about Dishonored, then they weren't. Good. They were gonna like, you know what? We did. We've done. What, we've had a success here. We're gonna move on to something else. So I think that if Dishonored was successful enough, or if they wanted to do a third Dishonored, I mean, I, I don't want to say that if it was successful enough because it would have. It could have been very successful. Um, well, they just I, wanted to move on to something different. Well, I, I do. Rem I do I remember. I'm sorry. I I do remember when Dishonored Two was coming out. There was talk about how there was no desire for the the, the the story to go on like this they they did it as a fan favorite kind of like they did with mirror's edge where there was no desire for a third game so that's why i was asking do you think they use death loop to get people invested into the dishonored universe so they can say okay there is a need for a dishonored three no i mean like they clearly i i haven't played two but very much the first the story of dishonored is centered around corvo otano the your main character and it's he kind of, I guess, they with one and two, they kind of told the story of Corvo Otano. He's back in the second game. I think his daughter is one of yeah, the playable. There's two, daughter, playable characters. I think it was two playable characters. Yeah, so I think that they maybe at just that point came to the end of what they wanted to do with Corvo Otano and moved on. But yeah, you're not going to use one game to promote another game because if those games had been out for years and you've released two games, if people aren't excited enough by those games, they're not going to go back and play them because of another game. I think there's definitely people who like the Dishonored universe and probably knowing that Deathloop is in that same universe if they weren't already interested in the game they might be more interested in the game you might might get some people who play Deathloop and are like their interest is peaked to go back and try the other two games but I think that's a much smaller subset and I don't think you bank on that as a developer I think that's just kind of a, a nice side effect well, right. also putting doing something like putting since Bethesda is now owned by Microsoft doing something like putting the Dishonored games on Game Pass will do you a far more service in that regard than using making an, an entire game with the goal of, hey, let's, let's try let's, and hook them into the old game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's make them buy this game so they'll also want to go back and play that. You know, having making them making the games more widely available and free. Well, not free, but for subscription on Game Pass is a much better means to that end. All right, an, an update from the chat, Matt G. Uh, says that Lawnmower Simulator, while it is a hundred and hour, 102 hour completionist, it only takes three hours to beat the main story. But to get the platinum, you're talking it, like, what, 15, 16 hours? It, it says 100, 102 hours. You're grinding miserably. A whole lot of grinding, yeah. All right, so uh, 
thankfully it is not a spam game because it is over an hour so you, you have to mow 1500 lawns in order to get the platinum trophy well I, I so i'll tell you i mowed the first lawn last night and i i would say it probably took me about 15 20 minutes to cut the lawn but Wait, Tricky, then, did you want to play this game because you can't mow your own lawn you don't have a lawn to mow in new york because i'm going to be honest with you i could have told you mowing lawns i don't hate it but it's certainly not fun no, I, 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 I downloaded this because one, uh, somebody, one of my personal friends, he likes the simulator game. So the, like the mechanic simulator, stuff like that. Um, so I was browsing on Twitch last night and a guy was playing a lawnmower simulator. And I was like, you know what? That's a nice relaxing game. I can sit there and talk to the chat as I mow the lawn. And it was just bad. Anyway, so I mowed the lawn and then I had to bring out the weed whacker and in order to beat the the level, I had to get ninety nine percent of the lawn. I was sitting at ninety eight point nine percent of the lawn because there was one blade of grass that I missed that I had to go find with a weed whacker. Like a pixel hunt? That's horrible. Yeah. So I was like, I'm I'm I'm, I'm not playing this anymore. All right. So now let's get off the lawn simulator. Uh, the next story: uh, Square Enix Montreal has rebranded one of. It has been rebranded under Embracer and will now be known as Onama. O N O M A. O N O M A. Um, they are the students behind the Lara Croft Go games. Um, I don't think they make anything but the mobile games. Am I correct? I think they've only done the mobile games when they were with Square Enix. Uh, Yes, they're, they're, they're behind the mobile games. So, uh, if you're looking for Square Enix Montreal, it is no longer called that. Uh, so. <laughs> I mean, they're no longer owned by Square Enix, right? So, of course, a name change had to happen. Look, this is the name. And apparently, the name means name, which is, I don't know, like the maybe most creative, least creative thing in the world. Um, but, yeah, no, so they're owned by Embracer Group, which now owns, like, all of the old games so who knows what's on deck for them to work on if mobile games or if they're gonna do you know who knows name good, means good name also yeah. password the password is password <laughs> the name means name yeah i mean yeah whatever i mean they've got bought by another company they need a new name all right so moving on i i thought this was interesting nice talking point because we always you know kind of curious behind the scenes of what this stuff is uh, this article is coming from IGN and is written by Ryan Dinsdale. Uh, Sony paid $3.5 million to put Ark Survival Evolved on PlayStation Plus for one month, while Microsoft paid $2.5 million to put it on the Game Pass for six months. Uh, as spotted by Kotaku, uh, on a filing with the U.S. Secretaries and Exchange Commission by Snail Games USA, the parent company of Ark Developer Studio Wildcard, Revealed the values paid by each company to feature the game in their free games lineup. Uh, so the tweet reads, Sony paid $3.5 million to put Ark Survival Evolved on a March PlayStation Plus game. Microsoft paid $2.5 million to keep it on Game Pass for the first half of this year. And $2.3 million to bring Ark 2 to the service when it launches. Uh, this is via a, a September SEC filing. Uh, so right around, well, no. It's actually more. Um, but, Yield, does that surprise you that Sony paid that much money to bring a game into PlayStation Plus? Well, yes and no. I mean, yes, you dropped that much money to bring a game in to Plus, but no, because we've always wondered, you know, majority, I would feel, and Troy can correct me if I'm wrong, but majority of game developers would probably not just be like, hey, put our game up there for free without some kind of kickback. So, and by the time they put ARC out, uh, ARC already had uh, multiple DLC packs. And I'm thinking they had at least five to eight DLC packs out there. So you've already got a very established game. And I know it's, it feels like it's kind of a niche game. I've got a buddy that loves the game. But, you know, up until he was telling me about it, I hadn't heard about it. 
you know, and then I see it show up for Plus. Oh, I know that's the game my buddy plays. But yeah, so, so for them to get 3.5 million, hey, just from Sony alone, good for them. But it, it is kind of a nice little peek of what kind of money that the developers can make for having their game available for air quote free. Well, that's going to depend, too, because if you're releasing your game on PlayStation Plus day and date or if it's on Game Pass day and date, then you're obviously... Because, like, you know, we talked about Rocket League when it first released was free on PlayStation Plus stacking. Tim Schafer joined Double Fine. That was free on... Um, Plus. I think it was free on some service. I can't remember if it was Microsoft or Sony's. It was Sony. Uh, it was free. What's that, Tricky? It was Sony. Okay. It was free for when it first released, so... That's obviously going to cost more money to have something like that. More surprising to me is the fact that Microsoft had to pay less to put it on Game Pass for six months. But I guess that would kind of... I don't know when these games were released on each service. So maybe Sony got it on PlayStation Plus closer to the release date. And Microsoft later down the road got it on Game Pass. And that's the reason it was less. It was cheaper for Microsoft. The, well, the way I see... The way I look at this... Okay, and again, I am could be 100% wrong because I'm only going off the tweet... It says Sony paid three point five million to have it on there for one month, where Microsoft paid two point five million to have it on Game Pass for the first half of this year, and they're paying another two point three million to bring Arc Two to the service when it launches. And as I read down in the article, uh, Microsoft paid that two point uh, five, two point three million. Uh, no, excuse me, two point three million, and it guarantees that Arc Two will be featured on Game Pass for three years after it's released. So, ultimately, Microsoft is paying uh, $4.8 million for both games, where Sony only paid for one game. So, I, I, I'm thinking, and, you know, the business could correct me, um, I'm thinking that because Sony only made the deal for the one game, they had to pay a higher price where Microsoft was willing to say, okay, we're going to want your first game and we want your second game, so we're going to pay the, you know, overall the more money to keep it on the service. I mean, does that sound feasible there, Troy? There are way too many variables in this scenario to, to even try and make any educated guesses on what's happening here. But my guess would be 3.5 million from Sony. Uh, that probably is a pretty good... I mean, so for any developer to get your game on one of these, these services, yeah, there's usually... There's definitely... There should be payment from the service, right? Whether it be uh, Microsoft or Sony. Uh, depending on you know, there's there's absolutely negotiations get, that go on. Uh, maybe uh, the month that it that Arc, I think if I remember right, the month that Arc was on on PlayStation Plus, it was the quote unquote marquee game, right? It was supposed to be the one. So maybe Sony was having trouble finding a game to fill that slot, and they needed to pay a premium to get it. Um, well, the month uh, I don't mean to cut you off. The month that Arc came out, it also came out with Ghost Runner, uh, Sonic, and uh, Ghost of Tsushima. Legends. Okay. Well, so Ghost of Tsushima is a really good one. Um, oh no! Yeah, so, it just no, just no, just the legends. Just the, edition. just the legends. It wasn't the full game. It was okay. just legends. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, it seems to me like Sony That's really needed a game. game to fill out their lineup, right? So they're probably going to pay a premium. It's it, it. From what I understand, they definitely were on the Sony platform first. So you know, the developer looking to recoup some of their development costs or whatever, like the 3.5 million is a pretty good chunk of change that probably does goes a long way to do that. And then when Microsoft comes along, maybe they're a little less strapped for cash and they're willing to, you know, let it go at a, at a discount. Maybe Microsoft's lawyers were really good at negotiating. I, I think maybe this, this deal to lock in uh, arc two is, is a good, like, Hey, we'll give you less for, for arc one for this amount of time, but we will give you this money in order to, to, to lock in arc two. Um, and once again, I mean, it's all, you know, negotiation between lawyers and, and everything like that. So who knows, you know, uh, you would think that Microsoft and Sony probably have a lot of leverage in a lot of these situations, but you just don't know. Um, so, yeah, there's just too many variables to make any calls on that. But I mean, it is what it is. Like they paid the money. Good for them. The, the, the studio got, you know, an influx of guaranteed cash uh, and a user base. I mean, I don't know. I've Arc had been out for a while, at least on PC. Like, I'm, I'm sure they're doing OK. But like, you know, any lump sum of cash that you can infuse into your studio to help further develop the game or to develop the sequel or whatever you've got going on. I mean, it's always a welcome thing, right? All right. Also, Tricky, would you, uh, the number for, for Microsoft to get Arc 2 on there, I thought you said over 3 million. Is it 2-something two, two million, 2.3 million? It's 2.3 million. Okay. 
just wanted to make sure. And I mean, do, once again, like Sony doesn't know that Microsoft is negotiating. Microsoft, they know that Sony paid something, but they don't know what they they paid. Uh, so you know, those two things happen in a vacuum. Basically, each side is negotiating for themselves, not necessarily against the other. The only company that knew all of the the dollars was the actual developer. Now, uh, I you know another thing that I'll point out there is that we found this out due to an SEC filing. Yeah. Should shouldn't we necessarily be able to go back to other filings that are public knowledge and see how much these companies were it, paid for these it games? Happens constantly. Like if you go back and like any time one of these big companies like does an earnings call, one you can listen. Most of them, if they're a publicly traded company, the earnings call is public. Is public, so you could sit in on like Meta's earnings call and, and hear everything. And they have to lay out like this is what we did, this is what we were expecting, like it, it because you're beholden to your shareholders and in order to do that like all the information has to be out there and then on top of being a part of the earnings call all of their financial statements and everything like that also have to be made public so you can actually go and 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 if you have the knowledge to read those financial statements you can glean a lot of information from them um you just it just takes the time to go in and look at them and actually well i mean it's i'd rather play lawnmower simulator to be honest with you yeah, from SEC filings and SEC like you know and, and and shareholder meetings, you can you can glean a lot. I mean, there's a you know an analysts that that this is their job, right? Like they they listen to the the shareholder meetings and they go through all the finances and and they can make deductions on which companies are are doing well or you know maybe in trouble. I mean, it's just surprising that you know with this public knowledge, this is like the first time that we've really gotten word of how much a developer was paid. By Sony or Microsoft, excuse me. Sure. Now, a lot of it depends on the company. If it's a publicly traded company, all that stuff has to be at least pr- provided. Like, it doesn't have to necessarily be transparent. Like, you can you can file certain, you know, incomes and, and, and what into different, you know, buckets or whatever, uh, depending on, like, hey, we built a new building or, hey, we built out a new office space. You can, you can, you're not fudging the numbers, but the numbers are kind of hidden in different places where it may not be evident. It's like, in the, it's the fine print. It, it, even less so like it's like well how did we we made this income where did the income come from we don't necessarily know here's what we've spent here's you know like it's 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 a little more complicated but this one was apparently pretty pretty laid bare so uh yeah it definitely gave us an insight that we don't normally get all right uh next thing we have uh it, this is also coming from ign and written by ryan zinsdale uh, Sony is producing way more PlayStation 5 consoles than it was last year, with new figures showing a 400% increase in shipments to the United States year over year. Uh, senior analyst at MST Financial, David Gibson, shared the stats on Twitter uh, following a huge spike in the number of units being shipped to the United States in September. Gibson also noted that the increase will be part of be in part to prepare for the God of War Ragnarok launch on November 9th, but the increase in shipments generally bodes well for those looking to buy a PlayStation 5 in the United States over the holiday period. Uh, Sony's next generation console, along with the entire tech industry, has suffered from severe production issues since it was released in 2020, caused by chip shortages and the knock-on effects of COVID-19. <coughs> so, uh, I'm going to go to the businessman, uh, uh, obviously, because I don't think you own a PS5, do you, Troy? I, I do not own a PS5. I don't own either of the quote-unquote current generation consoles. I I have a PlayStation 4. I have an Xbox One X. I have a couple PCs. I have a, a desktop. I have a laptop that's actually got a better graphics card than my desktop does at this point. And I actually recently bought a Steam Deck. So that's where my quote-unquote current generation gaming resides. But so actually, I was in Target not too long ago, like a, like a few weeks ago, and I saw the PlayStation Five there, and I made the comment to my Stop. wife. Stop! You saw like, one in the I wild? Don't, I don't have any like desire to buy a new generation console from either, you know, Microsoft or Sony. Like I have, I don't have that drive. Like I easily dropped. I I got the the top of the line Steam Deck, um, so I spent you know close to seven hundred dollars after taxes and shipping, or not shipping but taxes and whatnot. Uh, we have ten percent sales tax here in washington state but uh and and i i would much rather have spent that money on the steam deck than to buy either a playstation 5 or well you could uh apparently you could just go and buy your steam deck now there's no more waiting list for it sure yeah yeah i've reserved it the the day that it came out Uh, but yeah i I waited a year to get it but it was fine because i was able to 
purchase Target gift or gift cards from Target and actually saved a you know a decent chunk of money. Um, and then I transferred I transferred that purchase to a I, tr- I transferred it to my PlayStation card because I had a zero percent interest uh, uh, for, balance for. transfer deal. So I ended up I'm not paying any interest and I'm paying it off over like a year. So yeah, it worked out well. All right. But yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't have any desire to, to buy a PlayStation Five, and, and I mean, I know there's still a hot item. But I don't know how hot. Uh, they're they're starting to become pretty easy to get a hold of, and even easier, you know, as time goes. I think I've been sent invitations from both Amazon and Sony to like get in line to buy one, but it's like I don't care. Um, and it seems like the, every time they go up on sale on one of those, like the the Sony, like hey, get in line, like it's longer and longer that they're still available. Uh, so. It seems like if somebody really, really wants one, it's not too difficult to get one. All right. Well, uh, attached to this, because it brought up the fact that God of War Ragnarok is coming out, uh, if you saw in the Trophy Wars group, I posted that Sony is coming out with a God of War Ragnarok bundle, and apparently it's causing quite a ruckus. I saw the headline. Uh, so, Yield and Alice, I don't know if you saw this, because I sent it in the Facebook messenger. I did put it in the agenda. Um, apparently people are losing their minds because they're selling the console and the game and people that are upset because they're buying the disc version of the PS5, but they're getting a digital copy of the game. I would be upset too. Um, there's also people that are getting upset because they feel like Sony could have made a God of War themed PlayStation 5, um, which... I don't really see the need for that, uh, and I'll go into that. I'll go into that in a second. But people losing their minds. Uh, Yield, you you said you'd be upset as well uh, if you bought a console and got a digital copy. Uh, you want to elaborate? Well, if I'm getting a if I'm buying a disc game or a disc system, I would prefer the disc game, not a digital game, especially one like God of War. It was no different than buying the collector's edition of Horizon Forbidden West and getting a steel bookcase, but you've got a digital code for the game. See, me me and you are on opposite ends of that because I've been calling for years of developers to come out with a digital or a, a collector's edition with a digital game because I would oh, I buy my games digitally, so ultimately what I was having to do was buy the collector's edition, find somebody to buy the physical collection so I could buy the digital collection or the di- but, edition. So, but, but my response to you in that is I, I don't have a problem with you offering a digital version, but either one, don't hand out a steel bookcase, or two, offer both, and granted you would pay a slightly higher price for the physical copy as you would a digital copy, but don't sell me all the bells and whistles on that. And then you short me a disc. All right. Ma- know, I, 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 I feel, I feel if I'm dropping $300 on a, on a collector's edition, I damn well better be getting a disc. All right. So the collector's edition is a little bit different. Uh, I, I feel you on that, especially if it's steel case, but a lot of people collect steel cases without, I- we're even worried about that, the yeah, and th- th- that is true yes you are correct but i'm trying to remember the last time a console came out a, a console bundle that came out with the physical disc like even like i mean you have these custom or uh, at this point even like nintendo puts out you know themed switches that don't even have the game in them i got the animal crossing switch didn't come with a copy of animal crossing um, i know so. my my four i got the arkham knight bundle and did it come uh, with a physical copy of Arkham Knight? Yes. Okay. See, because, like, I, if, as far as I knew for the longest time, they've always come with the digital code for the game. Um, even if it, the, the, it's console itself, this is the first generation where you really have a choice between one that has a disk drive and doesn't have a disk drive. But I feel like for a, for a while now, like, even the ones that have disk drives, like, they would give you a digital. All right. Or if before- they had the physical version of the game, it was, like, a not-for-retail sale version, like, it, like... It was a little bit different than when, when you pull off the shelf, right? All right. Before I let Alice go, uh, Matt G says in the chat, digital game slash console bundles should have the game preloaded on the system. Also valid. Cor- correct. Valid. I mean, that that's how we got um, 
Astro's pl- uh, Playground when you bought your PS5. Playground. It was a pretty pre pre. I don't was it. I thought I still had to download. It you did, but it was kind of automatic. Right. But I mean that. But, 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 but that wasn't. Right? But that wasn't like, really. It's like we have the firmware. We we flash the firmware on it and we ship it. Like to, to add that extra step in production, where it's like, okay, now we have to make sure that the game is on the system. And then at this, in this day and age where, like, games are constantly being updated, it's like, well, what version of the game are you getting anyway? At least if we put the code in the box, you choose to re- redeem the code, you're going to get the most up-to-date version when it downloads, right? Well, see, okay, uh, to go on to Matt G's point, because I just thought about this too, what if you buy the, the God of War uh, bundle and you don't have internet? That, now you can't even play your game. The, well, you're you're hosed, right? Because now you can't even play your game for, for a couple generations now, right? Like they always say, like, oh yeah, there's a way to do this, but it's always a huge pain in the ass. It's got to be something you take into account when you buy any console in the last like two or three generations. All right, uh, Alex, your thoughts and opinions on this, sir? I mean, it, in a perfect world, just give somebody a digital code for the game and a physical copy of the game for something like this. Um, at the very least, like Matt G said, have it downloaded on the console. But yeah, just give people a digital copy and the uh, the physical disc. So you're saying do to... both, not one or the other. Both. Do both. Tricky would love that because then he just sells the physical copy and keeps the digital one. <laughs> well, I, I I would. Well, he would sell. He would sell. The, he would keep the physical copy and sell the digital one. Or is that what you said? No. no. He, would, he would keep the. Digital I would keep one. the he digital and sell the physical. He would physical. probably sell the digital. I, yeah, I would do the opposite. If it's I would not keep the already physical downloaded and sell on the system, then he could just turn around and sell the code or give it to a friend. I mean, maybe that's a decent strategy. Okay. Yeah. That, okay. Good point there. Um. I you know. I think one be upfront. People say, "Hey, this is what you get. You get a digital copy of the game." We got to understand. Sony's trying to get away from physical copies of games, just like Microsoft's doing. The only company that's like, please buy physical is Nintendo. Um, but so, I mean, yes, it, it would make sense that, hey, I bought a, a disc based console with a disc drive. I want the disc based game. But also, that's not where Sony and Microsoft are trying to push the video game industry. So as long as they're upfront about you get a digital copy of the game, uh, you know, I'm fine well, with it. Everybody's getting the anger out of their system now before it comes out, right? Just, just, just be transparent and say this is what you get, exactly what you get into this th- in this bundle, and that way, if somebody wants a physical copy of the game, they don't have to buy it. And if they don't care, they'll buy it. Um, well, like, they they are being transparent. Long, That's what's causing the point this problem. Of trying to reckon with the fact that we're getting away from physical media. That's just something. That if you play video games, you're gonna have to reckon with it at some point. Well, they they are being transparent, Alice, because that's what's causing this controversy, yeah. and the other con- anger out now. And, and the other controversy, like I was saying, was like they, they people are getting upset that because they they don't have a God of War themed console. Um, what the other the other part which I didn't bring up before is that they're uh, one thing they're also complaining about is that uh, they announced the special edition God of War uh, Dual Sense, and that's not packed in either. You get a normal Dual Sense, but. Here's my thoughts with the, the the PlayStation 5 and themed consoles. I don't think we're going to get themed consoles because the, the, the plates on your PS5 are interchangeable. They can, you know, you don't have to buy a themed console anymore. They can just sell you the plates. They should start doing that, though. If they're going to shut down other people who are making plates, which I think they've already demonstrated, they should start taking advantage and, like, making... Custom plates. Well, they they I are, totally agree. Well, they are they are making plates right now. I mean, granted, right now it's only colors. Yeah. It's only colors. Uh, but you know, you could come out with a God of War plate, and then you know, when when the next hot game comes out, they can make a Last of Us plate, or they can make an Uncharted plate, and they could sell that. Um, and I mean, just from a business standpoint, you'll make more money that way. Because if they if they sell the plates with the console, then you're paying for the console. But if they they say the console, then they say okay, now we're going to come up with plates. Now they can charge you sixty dollars a pop for the plates and make more money in the long run. They don't have to have themed consoles anymore because of the removal of plates. Where, I, do that, <laughs> where I, I agree, because um, you know a couple people compare it's like, well, 
Microsoft came out with a Halo themed console. Well, their plates, they, their outsides are not interchangeable. You know that it makes sense for them to do that. Where for Sony, because I mean, right or wrong, it was smart for them to make their console with removable plates. It would seem like they're just not taking advantage of that right now. And and, and I think that I think now that we see like the the production issues are are subsiding, I think we'll see that more and more. I think they were more worried about getting the consoles into gamers' hands than they were about trying to profit off of whoever had the console already. That's valid. Um, see, but yeah, no, they definitely need to be doing that. Like seriously, like that's money that they're just leaving on the table, right? People will buy custom plates, then then you have your custom console. I mean, I, I'd buy a custom plate. Sure. D- depend depending on the what it was, yeah, I'd get one. Yeah, I mean, I do. I think they're a little expensive. Yeah, sixty dollars a pop. But no, I'd wait for them to go on sale. I don't. I don't think they're gonna go on sale. There, yield. Uh, well, if, then I. If they're selling them in like GameStop or Best Buy or Target or places like that, they will go on sale because at some point the retailers like, all right, these are taking up space, so they're not selling. We need to get rid of them. Oh yeah, I, I, I meant I don't think they're gonna get from Sony uh, PlayStation Direct. I don't think you're gonna get a sale. No, probably not. Um, all probably right. Like Black Friday or something. <clears throat> Uh, at this point, we are going to throw it across the pond to our main man, Sid. Hello, my friends. Sid again with Sophie's Trophies. Um, before we start, guys, uh, sorry I didn't do one last week. Um, me and Mandy have had a few problems, um, and depression hit me again. Um, so I really just couldn't record last week, guys. I'm doing all right now, I think. Um, but you know what, every now and then it hits you and it takes a toll. So um, just a little message for everybody. Um, just look after yourselves. Look after your brain. Look after your mind. Um, you know, because you're important. Um, every single one of you is important. Um, but this week, guys, I am back again. Okay. And um, it's supposed to be a Halloween game. And it kind of is. If you look at it in a roundabout kind of way, this is Square Boy versus Bullies. Um, it is a rat game, but it is a good rat game. It is a pared down Streets of Rage type game. Very simple. Uh, plays pretty much the same as Streets of Rage and those kind of games. Um, simple uh, graphics, simple animation, but it's a good little game. Um, not too bad to go through. I think I covered it when I first started Sophie's Trophies many years ago. So, we're going to see if I can do a better job this time around. Because I'm playing it, and as far as I'm concerned, bullies are the most evil people in the world. So, yeah, Halloween themed. Okay, so, Platinum Guys, Square Boy versus Bullies. And, as always, that one is Defeat All the Bullies. Then we have Knowledge is Key. Open the Moves list in the Pause menu. Um, I have to say, there's quite a surprising amount of moves in this game. Then we have Striker. Hit an enemy with a strike combo. So use your square button and hit your enemies. Uppercut Hero. Hit an enemy with a jump punch. So hit jump and punch at the same time and hit an enemy. What a kick. Hit an enemy with a jump kick. So jump and press attack and you will do a jump kick. Eyes at the back. Hit an enemy with a back punch. Um, this will just probably happen by accident, like I did it, um, you know. It's all very simple, it's all pressing the direction buttons when you press the punch and things like that. So if you press back and punch at the same time, you will do this move. So fast, hit an enemy with a dash attack. So for this one, press forward, forward and punch. Uh, kind of Street Fighter combo-ish type thing, and you will do the dash attack. Like a tornado, hit an enemy with a spin punch. So this one is up, up, and square. A clean sweep. Hit an enemy with a spin kick. This one is down, down, and square. And then we have gotcha. Grab an enemy. So same as Street Fighter. Street Fighter, not Street Fighter. Sorry, guys. Streets of Rage. You've got to go um, and walk up to an enemy, and you'll grab them. Then we have hey ya. Throw an enemy. Uh, Very simple. Once you grab them throw them home run hit an enemy with a baseball bat unleashed hit an enemy with a chain 
tire or tire. Hit an enemy with a tire. Boxing champ. Hit an enemy with a box. Taking out the trash. Hit an enemy with a trash can. Early delivery. Hit an enemy with a crate. So all of these guys, you walk up to them, you press circle to pick them up and you can either attack, as in with the chain and things like that, but with the other ones, um, you will throw them. So you need to put a bit of distance between yourself and an enemy and then throw them at it. Then we have weapons master. Hit enemies behind and in, and in front of you with a single swing of a weapon. So using any weapon, guys, do the up, up, spin move, up, up, punch, and you will spin with the weapon in hand. Just make sure someone's in front and someone's behind. Then we have Gotcha Slippery Ninja. Throw a crate on the ninja bully on the ship deck. This one really is the only missable trophy, guys. When you're fighting this boss, uh, make sure to pick up the crate that's on the ground and hit him with it. Because once you go past him, you've got to start the game again to get there. Uh, training. Destroy all the dummies in the dojo. So this is very simple. The game doesn't continue until you do it. Bandanas are silly. Defeat bandana bully on the hideout rooftop. So very simple there. Beat that guy. Black robe alone maketh not the ninja. Defeat ninja bully on ship deck. So this is the one where you have to throw the crate at him. Just make sure you throw the crate at him and then beat him. And then bigger they are, harder they fall. Defeat big boss bully. Um, so obviously the big guy, you've got to take him out. Then we have bullying is uncool. Finish the game. Stand up for yourself. Defeat 10 bullies. Stand up for your friends. Defeat 100 bullies. Stand up for everyone. Defeat 300 bullies. And that, my friends, is Square Boy versus Bullies. And you know what? That is a pretty good trophy list, I have to say. Very attainable. Only one missable trophy. Uh, the game itself isn't overly long. Probably an hour, hour and a half. Um, you know, enjoyable little game to play. So, yeah, that's going to be it from me this week, guys. I uh, hope that was okay. And like I say, everyone, look after yourselves. Um, look after each other. And keep getting those trophies. Bye. All right. Thank you, Sid. Always a great Sophie's Trophy. Uh, I just want to personally say fuck that game. Because that last mission is hard as fuck. Really? Sid, say, you take, made it. take care of yourself, Sid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're feeling better. Yeah. What would you say, Alex? I was going to say Sid made it seem like it was no big deal. Well, I don't know if Sid has the platinum. He may be just talking out of his ass. He said he said it was a... Wow. He's feeling better this week, and then you're talking... You're like, oh, maybe he was talking out of his ass. Sid knows I love him. Don't don't try to drive a wedge between me and Sid. I'm not. You're do, you're driving the wedge yourself, sir. So. I'm not driving anything. But I am pressing a button. I don't, I don't know. You aren't driving a lawnmower anymore. I, I'm pressing the button now. Time to check my... Social media, yeah. Troy, I don't know if you've ever heard that before. No, I don't think I had. What, what are your thoughts on it, sir? Uh, it's a transition. <laughs> <laughs> There's some people that love it, some people I, that hate I don't it. Think, I don't think he's a big fan of it. <laughs> I don't know. Like it, it is what it is. There's some people that love it, and some people that hate it. I think with kids, Troy's seen way too many Disney movies. Maybe The Lion King way too many oh, times. Oh, The Lion King. Yeah, no, that was a staple. I mean, I was the kid watching the shit out of Lion King. Did, did I Just, you know, before we go into our question, does did any of us watch the live action of Lion King? I no. did. I, I, I haven't even seen the cartoon. I may have seen it once. You've never seen the Lion King, Yield? I wasn't interested in it. Wow. I owned the album. I was singing them songs. Shoot, yeah, dude. And you like, you seen the live action version? When that came out, I think I've seen it once. I don't think I saw it. Is, is it good? I think it's a. I think it's almost a shot for shot remake, but like with CG animals, right? Like it's. I don't know. They didn't. They didn't wow me for sure. I think I'd definitely rather watch the, the animated one because they yeah, look but... like real animals, but then they like talk it and shit. Like I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably watch the animated version, but I mean, I enjoyed it. 
All right, because the, the only live action Disney movie I watched was um, Beauty and the Beast. The other ones I haven't watched. Close to shot for shot too, right? Except they added like a couple of scenes. They added a whole song. So yeah, yeah. And, and and they made some uh, some changes within the you know for the characters and stuff like that. Stuff I didn't necessarily agree with, but you know it's, it was a sign of the time, so yeah. you know, it is what it is. Really, the only live one I wanted to see is Mulan. That's not out yet, is it? Yeah, the live action Mulan's out. Is it? Okay, I I, I legit uh I didn't think that came out. All right, so our question, and we're gonna start with Alex. Uh, comes from Matt G. Says, "What is the rarest physical game you own?" Uh, I honestly don't really have many rare physical games to be honest i don't know if it would be one of my super nintendo games i have the gold cartridge ocarina of time with the box I, still with the shimmering box on the front I, I think i may have that as well i'm not really i mean i don't know that that's considered rare because of how popular ocarina of time was but um i'm trying to think of of super nintendo games I and mean, i don't know something like looney tunes basketball that was like super weird it may not have been picked up by a lot of people uh yeah, I mean, other than that, I've got like your your Mega Man X's, your I've got Super Punch Out, Donkey Kong Country. Just I've got a lot of the staples, not like necessarily any of the uh, the super expensive games, but with my physical game collection being so small at this point, I don't necessarily know if I have anything that's really really um, uh, rare. I mean, I've got like old NES games like uh, Dragon Spirit, Castlevania, Mike Tyson's Punch Out. Mega Man 3. Now, that might be worth something since they've changed the name. Oh, you mean Punch-Out? Yeah, since it's Mike yeah, Tyson's so Punch-Out. They went to Mr. Dream. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that stuff's, like, a lot of stuff is hand-me-downs from my brother, who's 11 years older than I was, so that's, like, from the 80s, um, which, I'm well, NES cartridges would be back from that era. But, yeah, uh, as far as I can think, that's probably some of my rarer stuff. All right. Yield? Uh... trying to think of some of my nes stuff i mean i've got gotcha i've got freedom force hogan's alley i don't have the boxes for them but i do have the games um i'm sure there's probably an obscure nes game that i've got that that would be a rarer one that would probably be about it for my rare games because i don't have any atari games all right troy Oh, I was thinking about this. Uh, one game that I had that I didn't know was, I guess, relatively rare, and I traded it into GameStop for, like, pennies on the dollar, was the PlayStation 3 version of the Orange Box. I didn't find out till later that it was pretty, oh. like, limited release and like, oh, apparently the, worth quite a bit the, of money. The, 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 oh, yeah, the, the Half-Life Portal yeah. one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah my buddy. that my, into GameStop. Oh, my buddy's got that one. That's how I play Portal. Yeah, that's how I played it, too. And, yeah, I traded it back when I was done. I was like, okay, cool. And then, like, later on I find out, oh, this was pretty rare. Oh, crap, I definitely didn't get what I probably was worth. What you could have got out of it. <laughs> exactly. Um, probably some of my Dreamcast games are pretty rare in that, like, at their actual, like, Sega release Dreamcast games. And at this point, like, at some point people didn't buy those anymore. They just they pirated them. So most people's Dreamcast collections are probably just burnt CDs, and mine are actual, like, genuine like a Dreamcast game. Games. <laughs> but uh, I actually just recently, in fact, it's supposed to be here tomorrow. Uh, once again, it, there's probably a theme if you hear all the games that I've been playing and, and the games that I'm, I'm into is uh, there's a, a DS game that came out actually after the 3DS was released. Uh, it's called Pokemon Conquest. So it's a, it's a turn-based tactics game uh, that has Pokemon. It's kind of a crossover between Pokemon and some other like grand strategy style like feudal japanese uh, game that's big in japan um and that one's been pretty tough to get a hold of only because the, and not tough to get a hold of I mean, they're definitely available but like copies are going for like 70 dollars without a case up to you know 100 120 dollars with the case uh, which is kind of a lot for a game that was probably 30 bucks when it was new uh, so it's just kind of hunting to try and find one at a decent price but i do have a copy of that that's that'll be here that i i paid like 40 bucks for so I felt pretty all right Great paying job. ten bucks over retail on it, uh, but that that one's uh, yeah because because it came out after the the 3ds was out so it was like 
kind of obscure as like, oh, a turn-based tactics game with Pokemon, and oh yeah, like we've already moved on to the new system, so it was, you know, pretty pretty small production numbers. So it it was kind of a pain just to find one that that I was willing to pay for. All right, and here, here in hold on, uh, real quick, here in Troy Talk reminded me I do have a PS2 copy, an actual original release PS2 copy of Psychonauts, and given like I've, I've said before, how there were two copies of that game at my GameStop when I went there, and how obviously commercially unsuccessful the, the, the game, that game was initially. Uh, you know, a PS2 copy, like an original PS2 copy, may not be all that uh, common in the wild. Uh, although I looked at um, eBay, and like a sealed copy of it is like around 100 bucks, like 96 to 100 bucks. So not super rare, but. All right. And I actually. Um own every single Atari game ever made. It's sitting in a box. I don't have the system. I have the, the actual cartridges. Um, <clears throat> and I say I own it, but I don't physically have them in my hands because uh, when I lived with my grandmother when I was young, uh, she had the Atari and for some reason uh, while she hates video games, somehow bought every single Atari game ever made. So they're sitting in a box. And my grandma. So you got a copy of E.T. there? I have a copy of E.T. I, actually, I think I have three copies of E.T. Um, but if I want more, I'll just go bear, uh, dig them up in the desert somewhere. So that, I, at the time that it happened, I was at New Mexico State University, and that landfill was probably an hour's drive away from my university in Alamogordo. And I remember being there, like, almost thinking, like, should I drive over to Alamogordo and see if anything comes of this? And I didn't. Dig, dig, one, dig one up and keep it? It was a really windy day, and I was like, yeah, I think I'm just going to go ahead and stay here. But I do remember that day when they were digging them up, and it were like, they were like an hour away. In fact, I'm pretty sure Phil Spencer was at a game stop in, in Las Cruces, which is the town that New Mexico State University is in. Uh, um, but They probably flew in El Paso, which is the closest you know, regional airport. But my rarest game that I own, um, and I was actually able to finally get it uh, thanks to uh, a friend of Dale's who I can't remember. I think it was Joshua Adams, but... I, I know you can't see it because my camera's dark, but sitting up there is my original PS1 copy of IQ in perfect condition. I was I finally able to get it and never stuck it into a system, but just put it on my shelf. And then uh, now I play IQ on my PS4 and PS5. But that's the rarest game I own. Because uh, that is a hard game to get. Yeah, and uh, I, I think he sold it to me for like $20. I just had to pay for the shipping. $20 in the shipping. Oh, sold? Yeah, I was like... It, 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 it was one of those things where... Uh, I, I think he put it out. I was like, hey, I'm looking to get rid of this game. Does anybody want it? And Daryl instantly messaged me and goes, dude, I know you've been looking for this game for the longest time. And I reached out to him. He's like, yeah, send me $20 and pay for the shipping. And I was like, um, where do I send the money? <laughs> so I actually own the game now. Uh... Because I, I don't know if uh, you guys actually remember the story. I found a used copy in a uh, retro game store in here in New York. And for... An outrageous amount for it, wasn't it? Yeah, it was for a horribly scratched up version of it, used. The guy wanted $140. So I was That's like, awesome when, when you run across somebody that doesn't really know what they have or, or just want to get rid of it. <laughs> Well, yeah, he just wanted to get rid of it. I, I, I think he knew what he had, but he was like, I, I've never played this. Um, it's still in the plastic. <laughs> oh, even better. Yeah, so I was like, I'm good. <laughs> Where do you want me to send the money? I'll send it right now. Yeah, and then, right now. And then when I got it, I was like, you know, now do I open this? I'm like, no. No. Because <laughs> I can no. put. Because if I remember correctly, IQ is on the PlayStation Classic as well, right? I don't know. I didn't get it. It, it was. Classic. Yeah. It was? Okay. So I could have played it there, but now that it's on PS4 and PS5, I get trophies with it. So now that's where I play it. All right. So uh, before we go into our topic of the week, I just want to put it out there that we are getting close to episode 550, and there's a poll inside of the Facebook group. Um, I'm testing out an idea, and I'm not going to guarantee this, but I'm testing out an idea to see if we can get people to call in live during the show. So we can get live reactions instead of just being in the Twitch chat and whatnot. I don't know that I'll get it to work. It's going to take some testing. Uh, but right now, the, there's a poll there. Uh, nine people have voted. I'd like to see more. Uh, but I, if you guys want us to do, to, do the live call-ins, 
Do you want uh, pre-recorded messages like we've done in the past? Or if you want a combination of the both, uh, let us know. Uh, right now, combination of the both is winning the poll uh, in uh, six votes to three. So uh, let me know what you guys think. Send me messages and whatnot. Also, we're looking for guests. We're starting to run out of uh, scheduled guests. If you want to be on the show, let me know. Send me a private message or respond in the Facebook group and let me know, and I will get you set up. All right. Now we get that all out of the way. Let's get into our topic of the week. And I'm glad that Troy is here for this because this is going to be a talking point. Uh, coming from IGN and written by Kenneth Shepard. Uh, Xbox calls PlayStation too big to fail following a UK agency criticism of the Activision Blizzard deal. Now, Troy, ever since this deal has come up into the news, I've wanted to get you on the show to get your feedback on this because as a business standpoint, you could let us into this, but let's get into the article here real quick. Uh, in response to, to claims con claims by concerns raised by the UK's Competition and Markets Authority, Microsoft released a lengthy statement to GamesIndustry.biz calling the criticism, quote, unsupported, End quote, and point to PlayStation's lead in place in the market as a reason why. Quote, the suggestion that the incumbent market leader, that being Sony, with, with clear and enduring market power can be foreclosed by a third largest provider as a result of losing access to one title is not credible. This, end quote, that's made by Microsoft in a statement. While Microsoft didn't share figures, the company says that if every Call of Duty player on PlayStation's console switched to Xbox... Quote, the PlayStation gamer base remaining would be significantly larger than Xbox, end quote. Uh, another quote, in short, Sony's not vulnerable to hy hypothetical foreclosure strategy, and the referral decision incorrectly relies on self-serving statements by Sony, which significantly exaggerate the importance of Call of Duty to it and neglect to account for Sony's clear ability to competitively respond. While Sony may not welcome increased competition, it has the ability to adapt and compete. Gamers will ultimately benefit from this increased competition and choice, end quote. As far as the CMA is concerned about the streaming market, Microsoft says it has, quote, no advantage, end quote, and that Microsoft feels that it has a, quote, number of significant disadvantages, end quote, in comparison to other competitors because of the relatively limited platform support for Xbox Cloud Gaming. The company also said the adoption of video game streaming is relatively low and that undermining the market in a way could only have long-term damaging effects to its products. Uh, the article does go on and, you know, I could bring some more of that up as we go, but I don't want to bore you guys with the whole article right now. Uh, before we go to the business, let's go to Alex and uh, what are your thoughts on Microsoft's comments about uh, Sony? Well, I mean, I've echoed some of those sentiments that to Jim Ryan with all his complaining he's done. And it's like, well, Microsoft now owns this. And if they decide to do well, when the deal goes through, they will own that. And whatever they decide to do with it is fair game. And you need to adapt and you need to make sure that your company thrives in the best way it can in the face of competition. I think some of what is said is true in there. I mean, obviously, Sony wants as little competition from Microsoft as possible, but I also, looking at Microsoft, Microsoft has, as a company has a lot more money than Sony does as a company. So the fact that it's like, oh, well, you know, we don't have any specific advantage over Sony. It's like, yeah, you do. You got a lot more money. You could broker a deal to spend $70 billion to buy Activision Blizzard, which Sony could never do. So Microsoft does have an advantage there. Now, obviously, they came into the video game industry later than Sony, like a generation later. And like I said, give them credit, they have done really well where other companies have failed trying to get a leg into the video game industry, which costs a lot of money. Um, so I agree with most of it. I think Sony just needs to shut up and adapt and, and make their business strategy, just improve their business strategy. Sony's not going to go out of business because of this. I've always said that Sony has been overblowing the importance of Call of Duty. I understand it's important, but the entire games industry does not um, hinge on Call of Duty. And at some point, Call of Duty is not going to be a thing anymore, and people are going to get tired of it, and it's going to go away. Like, for, for the rest of our lives, Call of Duty is not going to be the number one selling game of all time, or not the number one selling game of the year. I guarantee that. Uh, but also, again, we have to remember that when Microsoft says we have no decided advantage, 
Well, maybe when you compare your game's revenues to Sony's, but again, your parent company has so much more money than Sony, so you do have a technical advantage there, a financial advantage in that regard, which if Microsoft wanted to take a loss on the on their game studios and say, well, we make enough money, but we want some of the money coming in from the video industry so we can just, you know, afford to spend this much more, more money to do stuff, I mean, they can. So, uh, but I do agree with most of what was said. Um, All right, yield? I, I I'm still on the boat that Microsoft just needs to make games and make good games. I mean, yeah, Sony's probably in front because they make good games. Microsoft has been kind of lagging the last generation and even into this generation where they're not there, you know, you know, name me five, console sellers for Xbox that make you go, I want to buy an Xbox, you know? So, um, <coughs> but I, I agree with Alex with the, you know, if they were to lose Call of Duty, it's not that big a deal for, you know, in Sony's aspect, even though Sony's making it sound like they'll just have to close the doors if Call of Duty goes away. Um, if Microsoft owns Microsoft, the this deal goes through, they can do whatever the heck they want. They can make it console exclusive. They can make it multi-console. I mean, it's their choice. Um, and I agree with Alex with the Microsoft's got the bigger bankroll than Sony. So, I, I mean, I can see Sony throwing a fit about it on that instance that, hey, they can fork over $70 million and, you know, we, we can't do that. But if Sony just, like Alex said, adapts and just buckle down with what they do good at, which is make great single-player experiences. They throw in a few multiplayer games here and there that are really good, but their bread and butter is the single-player experience. I, they'll be fine. All right. So, Troy, before I let you go, I'm going to uh, read uh, – a statement put out by Microsoft that was tweeted out by Tom Warren. Um, and Tom Warren, if you're not aware, because I wasn't until just re just now, he's the senior editor at The Verge, uh, which is a reputable uh, website. All right. So this is him tweeting out Microsoft's comments. And it's a little lengthy, so I'll, I'll try to get through as quick as possible, but I'm going to go slow enough so we actually understand what I'm saying. All right, so Microsoft says the CMA's concerned are misplaced for the following reasons. Sony has been the largest console platform for over 20 years with an install base over with of over 150 consoles making it larger than Nintendo and more than double the size of Xbox. Point two, Sony engages in conduct today which is reflective of its market power in console gaming, including increasing the prices of its console without fear of losing market share. Third point, the suggestion that the incumbent market leader with clear and enduring market power could be foreclosed by a third largest provider as a result of, as a result of losing access to one title is not credible. There are more than 4,000 games available on the PlayStation alone. Point four. The evidence shows that less than PlayStation's monthly active users are playing Call of Duty. Even without all of those gamers, a high probability outcome of hypothetical foreclosure strategy, the PlayStation gamer would remain significantly larger than Xbox is today. Point five. Since the transaction was announced, Sony has acquired several game studios, including Bungie, the developer of the popular online game Destiny 2, Haven Studios, Langsdale, and Savage Games, and a minority interest in From Software, the developer of the biggest game of 2022, Elden Ring, among other hits. This complements Sony's existing minority shareholder in, excuse me, this complements Sony's existing minority shareholder in Epic Games, the publisher of Fortnite, strong first-party game catalog and extensive portfolio and exclusive arrangements with third-party publishers. There are over 280 exclusive first- and third-party titles on PlayStation in 2021, nearly five times as many as in Xbox. Now, Troy, I'll ask you before uh, I uh, let you go. There is more, more points. Do you want me to keep going with the points, or do you want to respond now? It's up to you. <laughs> okay, I'll go on to the next point. 
The CMA provides no evidence that the rivals rely on Microsoft's multi-product ecosystem for cloud gaming. The emergence of cloud gaming providers that do not rely on Microsoft's third, Microsoft's multi-platform multi-product ecosystem shows that Microsoft does not have the ability to foreclose the competition. And then the last point before I, they have a longer statement. Consumer adoption of cloud gaming remains low, harming or degrading rival services with significantly set back adoption of this technology, protecting market leading incumbents, i.e. Sony on console, Apple and Google on mobile, as well as Steam on PC. Microsoft as a platform, which is in last which is in last place in console, seventh in PC, and nowhere in the mobile game distribution globally, has no incentive to do this. Instead, its incentive is to encourage the widespread adoption of cloud gaming technologies, as by many providers as possible, to encourage the encourage the major shift in consumer behavior required for cloud gaming to succeed. Okay, I'm going to put pause there. I'm going to let you go, Troy. Yeah, no, I don't. Like, none of this is wrong. I mean, Sony is... Is they're exercising their right to try and do what they can to derail uh, their competitor getting a, a big boost, right? I mean, regardless of literally the facts that have been laid out uh, that are not correct, everything that was said about them not being the market leader, that Call of Duty, I mean... There's five people on this call right now. How many of you would leave PlayStation if Call of Duty became a Microsoft exclusive? Not I've one. I've never played a single second yeah. of Call of Duty. Not one. No, of us. I wouldn't. So zero percent of the the small sample that we have here would jump ship because Call of Duty went exclusive to Microsoft. And I mean, obviously you can't directly extrapolate that, but I mean, it is what it is. Like, if Microsoft, which they've said they intend to keep it multi-platform. <coughs> So, you know, even if they hamper it, like say there's extra DLC that comes to Microsoft that doesn't come to, to Sony, like I don't see that putting a huge dent in in Sony's, you know, market share. Another issue is like Sony coming at this from being the current market leader. I mean, you really kind of look like a crybaby, right? Like, like you, you are the number one, you're the top dog and, you know, like, it, it almost looks like you're bullying in some instances. I mean, it's hard to say because Microsoft, like you said, is a huge company with huge, you know, huge bankroll. Um, Xbox isn't their their focus. In fact, in the not too distant past, there was talk of them spinning Xbox off because the CEO of, of Microsoft didn't even really want it as a part of Microsoft directly. But like, it's it's really tough to to come at this from the market leader's position and act like the victim here. Uh, it's it's a real hard pill to swallow that being said this this cma thing is is literally like a like a consumer agency it's not i mean sony is appealing to them but it's the, the agency is ostensibly independent um and so they are you know weighing the facts as they see them but the, every point that microsoft brought up is not incorrect uh, in, in my mind i mean i i it's not kind of money because I'm sure Sony, you know, they have their the legitimate concern about competition and whatnot. Like, like I can see it from Sony's side. I can see it from Microsoft's side. So really what it comes down to is like who is the better, I guess, uh, negotiator when it comes down to it or, you know, like who lays the best case because they both have a case to, to lay. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's it's huge get for Microsoft. They have the money to spend on it, and but they've also not in the last couple generations really been that dominant with their their games and like yield said you like microsoft make good games but if a company like microsoft can't grow organically you know in, internally and come up with these these groundbreaking games the their best bet is to acquire companies that can and going after activision blizzard was a pretty smart bet if you had the money to make it happen um and that i mean the regulatory agencies are going to do what they they will with the information but I think Microsoft has a pretty strong case. Um, and as far as them talking about cloud gaming, I agree uh, that cloud gaming isn't taking off in any way, shape, or form. I disagree that they right now are the front runner in cloud gaming uh, with the recent demise of Google Stadia. There really isn't uh, a competitor on the market right now that really is in the position the way that Microsoft is. So. Microsoft is now an early mover in that in that 
space. And if that's where everything's going, then, then Microsoft definitely potentially has an advantage there. I, I, um, I want to cut you off for one second. Uh, yeah. What about Luna, which is Amazon's uh, cloud streaming? Yeah, what about Luna? I, I, I don't know anything about it. I just was offered a, a, a beta either, invite. Which is, which is like... That's pre-telling point, then. Right? Okay, I'm sorry. Well, yeah. I know Hold it on. probably exists. One and thing... I mean, there's probably plenty of companies that are in development of trying to come up with a cloud gaming solution. And if anybody can do it, Amazon is definitely up there, right? But they they haven't shown that they, they're they really behind it. The same way Google, like the Stadia thing, they kind of only half-heartedly really got into it, right? Alex, were you going to try to say something? Oh, no. One, one thing that we've talked about over and over again and, and something that Microsoft has talked about is said that we're not taking Call of Duty. It doesn't make take makes sense to take call of duty off of playstation there that's been mentioned nowhere well hold on in, in this response oh it, is it is it just later that that's the next section uh, so let me okay. get into that right now uh they would honor the contract which is anywhere from, what, what was it three to five years well, let, let me read uh, Microsoft's actual okay. statement here. It says, Microsoft has no intention to take Call of Duty away from gamers, and indeed has publicly committed not to do so. The value of Call of Duty depends on its community of gamers, the majority of whom are on PlayStation. Keeping Call of Duty on PlayStation is, therefore, a commercial imperative for Xbox business and the economics of the transaction. As such, Microsoft has offered Sony a contractual commitment to continue supplying it with Call of Duty, including new releases with features and content parity. The referral decision explains why, in the CMA's view, Microsoft would make such commitments publicly and privately, which are reflected in its internal documents, if it had no intention of honoring them. Four closure strategies of the type outlined in the referral decision would alienate Call of Duty gamer base and tarnish both the Call of Duty and Xbox brands, undermining its rationale for the transaction. Microsoft would place at risk over U.S. dollars in annual review from sales from Call of Duty on PlayStation, as well as substantial revenues from other Xbox games distributed via PlayStation. Microsoft has made it clear that it's counting on revenues from the distribution of Activision Blizzard games on Sony PlayStation. It's Minecraft over again, right? Like, Minecraft, they have it on all the platforms because they rake in the money from all of the users. And Call of Duty, more than even Minecraft, is dependent upon having that user base. And then now, you know, with Activision, I guess, being owned by Microsoft, making those games cross-platform is an easier task. I mean, I guess Sony could definitely block it from being able to happen, but like it's in everybody's best interest to have as many people as possible in literally one of the largest multiplayer games in the world, right? I mean, and I didn't put this in the agenda, but I saw a, 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 a headline saying that uh, Microsoft actually wanted to put Game Pass on PlayStation and Sony blocked it. Sure, yeah. That's, uh, once again, that's going back to the cloud gaming thing. Like, ultimately... They're, they're two companies that are kind of running two slightly different races. Like, I don't know that Microsoft, they're hoping that the market goes to a purely digital direction in that they no longer have to sell hardware. Like, you just have the Game Pass app or the Xbox, xCloud app on whatever device, be it a, a gaming console or even a television, and you no longer, all you need is, you just need one of these bad boys, right? And then you can turn around, you can play an Xbox game literally anywhere. That's where they're hoping that the market goes, and that's where they're kind of pushing the market with their, their attempts to get into cloud gaming and stuff. Whether or not that's where the market goes, who knows? Like, two generations ago, console gaming was dead, right? And it's still one of the biggest things in the world, so who knows? Like, the consumers are going to make that decision, but Microsoft's putting their money on things heading in that direction, and that's kind of where they're building the company. All right, Yield, you have uh, any more comments? Nope. <laughs> okay. Uh, Alex, you want to say anything? The last thing I'll say is the smartest thing Microsoft can do is keep Call of Duty on, on PlayStation, bring in that revenue, and then just offer the better um, experience on Xbox. They, It's going to go to Game Pass. You, If you want to play it on PlayStation, you can, but you're going to buy it. Whereas if you play it in our ecosystem, you're going to get for free on Game Pass day and date uh, as long as you pay a subscription fee. That's the best thing they could do. See, I, I, I think I think this conversation is really getting muddied up because of the recent uh, statement that was made that saying that uh, Xbox has uh, is only pledging to keep it on PlayStation. 
for th- three years after the current deal ends. Not only is that statement, you know, kind of murky and generic, because a lot of people took that as it's, Call of Duty's only going to be there for three more years. I read it as the contract is going to end in three years, then they're, they're promising three more years after that, so we're guaranteed another six. But why, if, if Microsoft had no intention of taking Call of Duty off of PlayStation, then why does a statement like that need to be said? Because that's only going to scare gamers into these kind of conversations. Six years is a long ass time, though. Like, and as a company, why are you going to contractually put yourself obligated for beyond? I mean, six years is a huge amount of time in in the gaming space, right? Like, who knows where we're going to be in six years? Like, if I am Microsoft, like, even if my, my intention is to have Call of Duty on PlayStation platforms in perpetuity, I'm not going to make a contract that locks me in for literally the life of the product or my company or anything like that. Like, you you set a, a, a decent, I think six years is a decent window, and then as that window gets closer, you reevaluate the situation and, and you renegotiate the contract. I think that's that's the, the benefit of both Sony and Microsoft, because, I mean, what happens when, you know, the the market flips, you know, or, or say Sony just completely dominates and Microsoft becomes like Sega, where they're just making games. Now, all of a sudden, that's the only bargaining chip they've got. Um, I think it's it's to everybody's advantage to not lock yourself in for a huge long term. I think six years is is a pretty decent amount of time to for an initial contract, for sure. And, and not to mention that in six years... If we don't have them in our hands, we're going to be on the conversations of the PlayStation 6 or the next Xbox console. So at that point, you know, it could be, like you just said, an entirely different ecosystem. I mean, I predicted we're going to get one more round of consoles before we go all digital. But who knows? In six years, we might be all digital. Nobody knows. Yeah. So, I mean, if I'm Microsoft, I wouldn't, like, make any serious commitment. I would say, look, I have no intention of taking this product off of PlayStation and right now it makes no sense to do that and I mean the the whole I mean the world could be a completely different place in six years at this point right like you don't lock yourself into something that long term I think that's not a smart business move in six years there will only be VR games so you and Yield aren't going to be gaming anymore huh no no that's a, that, that's okay I'll, I'll be close to re- re- getting near retirement so I'm okay with that well, in six years, I will be retired. So I just put that out there. Probably you retire. See, you'd be okay with that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to stop playing video games when they're retirement. Probably going to be oh, playing yeah. more video games. You still have all your old games, right? Like, yeah, I got, I got my, I got my big catalog. I got, I got, we got our, all got our big backlog. And none of us are playing Call of Duty anyway. So. And, and Alex is still trying to get 100% on every game he's ever played. Well, that's never going to happen because, you know, some of the servers are shut down. Multiplayer doesn't work anywhere anymore. So there are certainly uh, some games that's not possible. But you know what? Where it is possible, I'm going to give it the old college try. Honestly, I, can't, I, I know we've talked about this whole Microsoft Activision deal a lot. And for a while there, it was very scintillating. It was, it was enticing. But now it's getting to the point of annoyance where it's like, good God, just, just give it let them have them and <laughs> move on as a, as a, as a, human, be- a human race. You know, I, I was thinking about this the other day. It's like it, it, it. I laugh at the fact that none of us real ever play Call of Duty. Like it, it's just not there for us. And then every week we have some kind of conversation about Call of Duty on a game well, that because, none of us care about. That's because it's in the news. Well, yeah, yes, and the big elephant in the room right now, right? And and, and it, it is our job to bring you guys the news, so to speak, but. I, I just don't want to keep saying the same thing over again. Like, I don't care about this deal. When when Microsoft got Bethesda, I didn't care because I never played a Bethesda game. And historically, every Bethesda game ever released on PlayStation console was broken. And it was months it was and months. broken on Xbox, too, though. But... You could you could have just left the on PlayStation off of that. Like, every Bethesda game ever released broken. has been broken. Well, I mean... Some games have been broken and never really fixed, uh, but they got fixed on Microsoft consoles. I remember. I mean, I don't remember the particular game, but there was a whole big to do with uh, Greg and Colin when they were still back at uh, IGN. 
that Kyle was constantly bitching about how his Bethesda game never got fixed. I don't remember what game it was, but it, it, that's neither here nor there. All right, so at this time, we're going to close out the show. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. We'll start our shout-outs. We'll start off with the yields, sir. Uh, Shout-out to Tricky and Alex for recording tonight. Shout-out to everybody, uh, Matt G, Nitro, and anybody else hanging out in the Twitch chat. Uh, Shout-out to Troy for making his triumphant return to the Trophy Horse podcast. And uh, final shout-out to all the pimps and the madams of the Hordom for listening, downloading, hanging out with us, whether it be on the show or playing a game with us or in the Facebook group. You guys are awesome. All right. Alex? Let me give a shout out to the Fuel to the Fire of this trip. Yours, our fantastic community, whether it be people like Felicia and Curtis, whether it be people like Nitro and Mad G, just anybody who supports us in any way possible. We appreciate you all so very much. You're the entire reason the show continues to thrive. And uh, yeah, 550 and, and anything past that would not be possible without you all. Give a shout out to Tricky and to Yield. Tricky for, for bouncing back like a uh, like a last place in Mario Kart. Miss, missed, uh, missed you last week, sir, but I'm glad to have you back on this week's show, even though it's been a rough week for you. I had, I had to uh, throw out my blue shell. You did, and it hit us all right in the heart. Um, give a shout out, of course, to Troy for coming on. Always a fantastic time having you on, sir. And uh, next time you come on, which hopefully we, uh, you know, next next few months... We'll have to have you back on. Um, that may be too early to have Acid Rain, uh, king of the video game industry, but uh, we hope you continue with that because I know you got a lot going on. But um, we need more people making really good video games, and I'm certainly, I'm sure that you could uh, certainly do that, sir. I hope so. Yeah, it's Come on, with a little more gusto, Troy. Come on. I, I can't make any guarantees. I'm going to give it the college try. I, All right. Well, we'll only ask you to sign a six-year contract, and then after that, we we'll see what happens. That's like I said. That's the part I have the best grasp of is running a business, right? Like I don't know how to make games. I'm learning, but I knew the smart money was to start a business so that I could write all that off on taxes. But you know what? See, lo- you're already as, ahead of the game. As long as you're successful in business and your family is happy and healthy, that's all we can ask for. So, um, always good to talk with talk with you, my friend. Uh, also give a shout-out to the Kentucky Wildcats, who were on a bit of a slide, lost two games, one to Old Miss, barely, by three points, and then uh, to the Gamecocks last week, but uh, beat Mississippi State this week, ranked 25, top 25 Mississippi State, so it's a good way to get back into the, the W column. Uh, last but not least, give a shout-out to my awesome and gr- loving girlfriend, Ashley, who've been wa- who's been watching Midnight Club with me, as I mentioned before. We're getting ready to go watch some House of the Dragons, so lots of good stuff going on TV right now. Hopefully you all are... Uh, you know, we all love to play video games, but hopefully everyone's taking some time to uh, stop and appreciate some of the good stuff that's on television with their families, with their partners, whomever, you know, or, you know, just with yourself. There's a lot of good stuff on out there right now. All right, Troy, your shout out, sir. We'll start by shouting out uh, all you kind gentlemen here. I love being on the show. Uh, definitely don't get to do it often enough, but life being what it is. It's, it's an incompatibility on all sides sometimes, but uh, I, I definitely love podcasting. Definitely something I miss doing on the regular. Um, it, it does my heart well uh, that e- even if Tricky's just blowing smoke up my ass that everybody's uh, requesting me, it, it, it makes me feel good that somebody wants to hear my voice, uh, even if it's just Tricky. Um, but, you know, shout out to y'all. Shout out to Sid. I uh, hope you're feeling better. Definitely, you know, his, his message was good. You know, everybody needs to take care of themselves mentally. Uh, you never know, you know, uh, life is, life is fragile and you gotta, you gotta watch out for yourself and your family. Uh, make sure that's taken care of. Speaking of, I want to shout out my family who are currently upstairs. Uh, all, uh, my wife, my son, and my new baby girl, uh, shout out to the, my other children who are in New Mexico. Uh, one of which is now attending New Mexico State University where I went to school. Uh, last night was the uh, UNM, University of New Mexico, New Mexico State rivalry game, which New Mexico State won. Go Aggies. Um, also, what last night was the 18-inning uh, Mariners heartbreaker uh, loss to the Astros, which knocked them out of the playoffs. I'm not a big baseball guy, but that was kind of a big deal around here. Um, yeah, it's just uh, it's great to be here, and thanks, everybody. Uh, yeah, you're uh, not a baseball fan, but I'm sitting here watching the Yankees score right now because the Yankees are on the verge. Uh, yield before we can I can only wait, 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 hold on. You made fun of what the Mets earlier when they were 
out or getting ready to get knocked out, and here you are watching your own precious Yankees about to get knocked out of the postseason? Uh, listen, I'm, I'm going to say this, and you can say what you want. I am a Yankee fan through and through. I will always be a Yankee fan through and through. But this playoffs, if you won more than 100 games in the season, it doesn't look good for you. Um, no, because the Dodgers got eliminated. Dodgers got eliminated. The Mets got eliminated. The Yankees are about to get eliminated. Um, but, Yield, I have some bad news for you. Uh, keep a track of your uh, Cowboys-Eagles game. Uh, oh, no, I, I, I just saw it's 14 nil. Yeah, it's not looking good for the, not looking good for your defense, sir. Well, I, I, I didn't think my fa- my fantasy team had a slim chance, okay? <laughs> and right now it's not looking good. But, hey, the defense could get on a run and it could turn around. I highly doubt it. I've been expecting to lose for the last three weeks, and I've pulled it out. So I'm due for a loss in our league, okay? So I'm not upset if I lose. All right. Uh, I want to give a shout-out to Sweet Mama D., Shout out to the listeners. Shout out to Troy, who I am trying to secretly uh, get him to sign a 60 episode contract with us so we can at least get him back for a year. Um, I don't know how successful that's going to be, uh, but I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to work on the back end. Might have to call in Brian Cashman to sign the deal for me. Wow, don't we got the Brian Cashman reference? No, no, he no I'm the Yankees, I'm, I'm, right? He's an agent for the Yankees. He's the general manager of the Yankees, yes. Okay, well, uh, I knew okay. He was, he was in, uh, in cahoots with the Yankees somehow. I'm, I'm like, no, I don't get that reference. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you have to be a baseball fan. You have to be a Yankee fan to really know who the hell he was. Um, shout out to the listeners. Well, Thank you very much. That counts me out. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, there's no accounting for bad taste in baseball teams that are yield. No, my baseball team is actually one is considered one of the uh, foundations of Major League Baseball. They have just sucked in like the last twenty years. Nah. No, I'm serious. They are the first Major League team to have a night game. I they're they're uh, considered how, up there. How about uh, when you get you know up to twenty seven championships, you can talk to me. How about that? that? That's fine. But when a lot of people talk about baseball, my team's mentioned. Your I team's mentioned out. as well. Yeah, your, team, so your, your, your team's only mentioned because of how uh, Pete Rose, you know, bet against his own team and cost himself championships. No, he didn't cost himself any championships. What are you smoking? I'm he just, didn't bet against his team. He bet on baseball. Tricky. Get it's the easy, facts right. I, I'm just it's fucking with you, Yield. With so many championships when there's no salary cap. and uh, Oh, Yankees stop with that and nonsense. That, 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 that's true. The Yankees buy. You want to get into this? The Yankees buy buy their championships that's Major bullshit be, that is Major absolute bullshit be because it does not matter how many how much you pay each player it does not matter how much you pay each player the players still have to play against each other and i will reference the florida marlins the 20 2009 florida marlins who had the lowest payroll in major league history and still won a world series so fuck all that noise about oh they buy championships they still have to play together how often does that happen it's happened three or four times in the last 20 years. Oh, well, the percentages are going up then. I wish my team would figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be, I ain't lying, man. I mean, it, the last world championship was 1990. Come on. Well, yeah, I, I think our last one was 99. No, it was after 99. Maybe two. Th- oh, no. Oh, no. You guys still suck. Yeah. Well, there's always going to be Yankee haters. All right, let's close out the show. Thank you, everybody. If there's nothing else, until next week, happy trophy hunting. Peace. Later. Facebook.com slash even Philippines.
Five seconds of silence. Five, four, 